Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Podcast Juice. My name is Michael Dean. You are listening to the podcast on Prince. You see the title, so I'm not going to BS you with a whole bunch of talking. <laughs> we are joined none other by the legendary Alan Leeds. Alan, sir, how are you? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Man, thank you for coming on. And uh, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, we are huge. This is a Prince fan podcast, if you didn't know. You just of think, course. We, we've been doing this for 13 years. So uh, we've been waiting a long time to speak with you and put it that way. And also, I would be remiss, but I'm just excited. Uh, I can't forget my man, Mr. Big Sexy and Saxer. How are you? You know, I'm doing great. Had a little uh, hiccup in court this week, but it's all good. I handled it. And now the good stuff begins. Been waiting for this all week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, let's just jump into this. If you didn't know, Alan Leeds, uh, and this is a, it's an interesting individual to me in the sense of he has been in the presence of arguably some of the best talent in music and comedy throw that under as well in 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 generations like he's a, he's worked with generational artists i like to say that cross genres and across the generations and we'll get into that um but alan uh could you just tell the people yourself, if someone's to say, who was Alan Leeds? What would you say? Um, Herbert Leeds and Dorothy Leeds' oldest son. <laughs> that's, that's probably what I'd say. Um, when you say generational, when it comes to the music, that 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 just means I'm old. <laughs> it means I've been around long enough. To, yeah, you got all the knowledge, the wisdom. But uh, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. Um, my wife might argue with you, but um, <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Okay. Um, no, actually, I started as a tour manager for James Brown in 1969. Wow. And you're right that I've been fortunate enough, just I should use the word blessed. There's really no other word that... Um, Blessed that I've had a 50-year career on the road working with some of the greatest artists in in black culture history, and not just black, of course, but uh, um, from James Brown to Teddy Pendergrass and, uh, and uh, Harold Mullen and the Blue Notes, Bootsy's Rubber Band, mm. Barry White for a year. Um, and then, of course, that led me to Prince, whom I worked with for 10 years as his tour manager in the 80s. And then as the head of his Paisley Park Records, a joint venture with Warner Brothers Records, which um, I was the head of from 19, let's see, from the first of 1989 through 1992. Wow. Yes. And um, my years after Prince have included managing, co-managing D'Angelo for almost 20 years. Wow. Um, tour managing Maxwell and many, many tours as the producer of uh, Chris Rock's stand-up mm. tours. Wow. <laughs> well, we salute you on that. Good Lord. I'm just like listening to you say all these people. And I, I ask very specific questions because I'm a huge D'Angelo fan, uh, Rafael Sadiq, Maxwell, all of that. And so, I, I left out Sadiq. I know no. you did. <laughs> it's just, it's, I'm old. I can't. I didn't, take my memory. I didn't take my memory pills today. <laughs> I need to get some of those. <laughs> but um, OK, so. James Brown, you said 1969. That was the year I was born. So that I puts a lot of this in context as well. Um, I got to jump around here because I'm not sure how much time we have. And all, there's so many things I want to ask you. But James Brown, we don't even have to say anything. I mean, that's James Brown. We'd have to do at least four or five podcasts to if you don't already know what James Brown is. That's that's just American uh black. The world, the, the the soul of the world. That's all you need to know on that. One, you know, the, the, the nitty gritty where the grit started. That's that's James Brown. That's how I like to say. 
But you coming through that and going to uh, things like Kiss. But I just want to just get right to Prince. Um, 1983, 1999 tour. And you coming into that, I assume as a newcomer in that world, what was the first thing that struck you when you got on that tour? Well, this this isn't too profound an answer, but the, the first thing that struck me, quite honestly, I had been on a, on a tour with Kiss mm-hmm. as the tour manager, travel manager for a Kiss tour. That tour was winding down. And the 1999 tour needed a tour manager. They were already on the road. They'd been on the road for several months, and they wanted to replace somebody. So there was a job opportunity. And I was already super impressed with Prince and a huge fan. So when I was asked if I was interested in trying out for the job, I jumped at it. I got the job after an interview with Steve Farnoli and Jamie Shoup, who was then Prince's assistant. And um, the thing that threw me actually was the fact that the Kiss Tour, the gig had been a suit and tie gig. They were very much about having all their um, all their management people dressed very Madison Avenue style. So the only clothes I had with me on the road were like suit and tie type stuff, button down collars, several different ties, a couple of suits. And that's how I was rolling with Kiss for the better part of several months. <laughs> and I jumped on the Kiss uh, on the Prince tour and walked on the plane the first day, not knowing anybody. The only person I knew in the entourage was their production manager. I didn't know any of the artists, the musicians, nobody. And I walked, and, and of course, this was the tour where Morris Day in the Time, mm-hmm. Vanity Six was the opening act. So they were all together on a chartered plane. And I walked on with my Madison Avenue pinstripe <laughs> suit and tie. And everybody just just looked at me like I was from outer space because everybody on the plane had sweats on, <laughs> except, of course, not Prince. But, um, you know, so so the first thing I had to do was run out and buy some sweats. <laughs> so I could halfway relate because I think the suits were scaring everybody to death. I think they thought I was from the IRS or something. Hilarious. <laughs> wow. What was the... Um and, and that was a very competitive tour. We've heard the stories, you know, about the time and Prince. But what, what did you, uh, what, was there a tension between the bands or? Definitely. Really? De- de- definitely was. And um, um, coming in in the middle of, t- middle of the tour, of course, a lot of things had already happened that had contributed to that tension. Okay. Um, Prince had already broken up this relationship with Vanity. They were still friendly, but they were no longer an item. She wasn't sleeping with them anymore. Um, so that was a little weird. And, of course, famously, Jimmy Jam and Terry had broken off to Atlanta, had missed uh, to do a uh, recording session, had missed a flight because of weather and missed a show. That ended up with Prince eventually firing them. They were still there at the time. They weren't fired until the end of the tour. But the tension was very much there. And, of course, there was a musical tension because Prince had famously said and and stood by until his his last breath that the only man he was really ever scared of was the time. And um, I think members of the revolution felt the same way that, that, that this was a band where, you know, Prince had begun to cross over with Little Red Corvette in 1999 in the title song. And his audience certainly was bigger than the times. But once he got on stage, um, the time was was chewing them up musically. Mm. and getting tremendous response and just tearing the house up. So there was a musical tension as well. And a mutual that, that, that came from a mutual respect. Um, both bands totally respected each other. But when it came to really tearing the roof off the mother, it was like, <laughs> the 
the time was killing them. And, uh, you know, so all of that contributed to things to the point where Prince started changing his set list around a little bit to add some of the funkier stuff in his catalog and um, really basically to compete with the time because they were hard to follow. Interesting. Did, when you were in that situation and you had just, you know, you had been working with James Brown, who was a legend. How did you perceive Prince? I mean, he was he was, uh, you know, obviously very uh, famous. In, in my opinion, it was like a regional type of thing in America for a little bit before he just blew up. But did you think that he would become what he is today back then? Or did you just think, oh, this is a cool funk band artist? I'm curious how you saw Prince. No, I, I, I thought much more of him than that. But I, I don't think anybody then could have predicted the level of international superstardom that he achieved and the fact that his creative catalog would become so deep that we can sit here today, years after his passing, and just think of unending lists of songs. I mean, it's, it's you know, the, the body of work that he left behind is staggering. Yeah. I mean, now, I, I don't think there's another artist that has as deep a body of work that has so much quality. You know, to the point where now the, the the reissue of the sign of the times that just came out, the box set with goodness knows sixty some outtakes of songs that had been considered for the album or the album ideas that had preceded Sign of the Times, um, the Dream Factory and Camille and these other album projects that that never were really released. Um, you know, nobody could have predicted that, but I certainly realized that 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 he was going to be more than he was. I mean, it was it was plain to see that he had the goods mm. and he had the work ethic and the passion and the ambition um, to really become more than just somebody with a couple of hits and a funky band. That was clear. Um, now, after the 1999 tour, was there a break, or did you or did you immediately start working with them on Purple Rain related stuff, or how did that? No, not not immediately. I was still a freelance tour manager. So when that tour ended in April of, I guess it's '83. Um, I went back to the freelance market and actually went out on a tour with Cameo ah. and, and was out with Cameo for a bit. And then I got a call from Stephen Farnoli, one of Prince's managers, asking me if I was interested in coming to Minneapolis for what he said was kind of, as he described it, an off-road road manager job. <laughs> which was kind of strange, except it sounded like a steady paycheck. But more importantly, I was really interested in Prince's future. There certainly was a value to being part of the posse. So, um, you know, I came to Minneapolis and they were in the middle of, of beginning to organize dance lessons and theater, theatrical acting lessons with an acting coach for all the groups. And it was my immediate responsibility to, you know, you had the three groups, which had, had become, was to, about to become Apollonia Six. Mm. And of course, the new version of the time, having replaced Jimmy Jam and Terry, um, with St. Paul Peterson and, and a couple of other new people. And, of course, Prince and the Revolution, um, which now included Wendy in place of Des Dickerson. So we had these three groups. All of them were doing acting classes, dancing classes, and uh, goodness knows, and, and, of course, musical rehearsals. So my wow. gig was in, immediately my gig was to organize all those things because they were all using the same studios. So it was kind of like, okay, Apollonia 6, you're there from noon until 2, then you got to clear out and Morris, Morris and then come in at 2 o'clock and then Prince and then come in at 6 o'clock and, you know, organizing all of that stuff and making sure the the technical crews were available and all the facilities were up and running. 
morning. And um, then, of course, we were preparing prints for the famous show he did in August of 83 at First Avenue, which was a benefit for the Minnesota Dance Theater, but also was the first time Wendy performed on stage in mm -hmm. front of an audience with Prince, mm -hmm. and was also the, de the debut of a lot of the material from Purple Rain, um, which was very exciting. So we had to pull that show off. And um, the rest of it was preparing for the making of the movie. Wow. So what did you guys, I mean, that seems like a lot. Was it, did it seem like a lot to you guys? Like, okay, this kid is, and I say kid, like, but I say Prince is about to do a movie? Like, did y'all just think, okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it, of course it was a lot, um, <laughs> but, you know, it was all centralized and people were coming from home. So it wasn't like you were on tour and had to worry about hotels oh, okay. and transportation. You know, you didn't have that kind of stuff to worry about because everybody was at home. Uh, I mean, even the people like Susan, well, there were there were people like Apollonia and, and of course, Wendy and Lisa who were, who were not from the Minneapolis area, but they had apartments here. So, so basically everybody was coming from home. Um, okay. So that part of it was pretty, the, the, the uh, you know, logistics of it wasn't that, wasn't that complicated. And I, I, I wanted to ask too, like, how big was this team of people? Was it you and how many other people? Well, initially, there, there, there weren't too many people. It was just, I mean, there was, you know, guitar techs and a drum tech and, a, and an audio engineer. And, of course, Prince's recording engineer, Susan Rogers. But, um, but it was a pretty small crew that I, actually I had to assemble when I got to Minneapolis because he had been rehearsing with just a couple of local um, bar band guitar techs that were really not – up to the level of, you know, the quality of technicians that we were accustomed to on tour. So I had to find some some experienced technicians and move them to Minneapolis to cre basically create a crew gotcha. that that eventually turned into um, a much more expanded crew that we took on the road with the Purple Rain tour a year later. But but the crew was pretty small. It was it was a guitar tech, a drum tech, and a couple of audio people, and then just a couple of kind of gophers, gotcha. um, which was pretty easy to assemble. The idea of making the movie, which is is what you asked a couple of minutes ago. By the time I got there, I guess everybody else was pretty much in the mode because it was what we were doing. It was preparing for a movie. And when you start to bring in acting coaches from California, you realize this is serious. But I don't think anybody envisioned what it was going to become. As, as you said, right. it was kind of like, okay, Prince wants to make a movie. I don't, you know, a lot of us were, particularly me, I was very skeptical because I'm like, you know, in the pop world, mainstream America, this was a guy who had had two hit records. Right, right. right. 1999. And, yeah, there was a cult who dug Dirty Mind in his earlier records. And, of course, our, on the R&B side, he'd had more hits want to be your lover, controversy, etc. Mm -hmm. But um, but it wasn't like he was a huge star. I mean, we weren't we weren't talking about him on the level of a Michael Jackson yet. It was kind right. of you know, if Michael Jackson said he wants to make a movie, you'd say, Yeah, okay. <laughs> but you know, who this guy from Minneapolis wants to make a movie? Who the hell is he to make a movie? See, and you just said something very interesting to, to, to look at it. You said to a, like a mainstream audience, this would have been a guy who just had maybe two hit songs. And then the next thing you see is he drops a movie. I can't imagine seeing that today. Like, I don't know if that happens or not, but it um, just, that seems pretty wild back then for Prince to be able to, like I said, it, to have a movie. And he was like maybe an R&B guy. Yeah, it, it, it was it was absurd. I mean, it was beyond wild. It was just something that everybody said, really? You know, like, why should you make a movie? <laughs> you need to make another hit record. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and that was kind of the feeling. And and remember back in those days, artists would most artists would make an album, every, you know, maybe once a year. Right. And, with, and of course, Prince was somebody who was always writing new music that he wanted to get released. So, you know, he, he'd supply an album to Warner Brothers as soon as they were ready for it. He could have could have put out more records if they were willing to. Um, absorb that much material. Yeah, I, I got to ask, can I ask you another question? You kind of now you're really getting me thinking. Um, and you were just saying about how Prince, uh, you know, working on another hit and different things. But I was thinking at the time when, at this time, in terms of like black music, pop music, there was a lot of stuff dropping. I mean, it wasn't like Prince was the only one out there. There was some. People was doing their thing back then. There was a lot of jams came out Absolutely. <laughs> during that period. I'm, I'm curious from you, somebody who'd been in the business a little longer, even at that time, than Prince. How did other musicians, if you knew of, did they, how did they perceive Prince? Do you, did you ever remember like talking with I don't know, Bootsy or somebody and they mentioned Prince or something? Um. The only people I can think of that I remember talking about Prince, you mentioned Bootsy, he's one. The other was George Clinton. And the the fact that they were both fans, they already saw something in him. I mean, he was coming from from Dirty Mind on. He was coming from, from someplace different. You know, first of all, the idea of Minneapolis and the fact that he embraced it. I mean, you know, artists come from anywhere. You know, Bootsy came from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, you know, people people could, you know, where'd Michael Jackson come from? Indiana somewhere. Right, right. But, but normally they move to L.A. or New York or Detroit or wherever, wherever there's a, an active creative scene. Um, but you know, Minneapolis wasn't that place yet, and and the fact that Prince embraced it and stayed there, and um, insisted on doing everything himself and had a different flavor, and and he was one of the first. I know Kid Creole and the Coconuts were one, but there were there weren't too many R and B acts. I say R&B, black music acts that embraced mm-hmm. any of the punk rock culture that was also happening. I mean, you had the glam rock thing in the 80s. You had punk rock, which kind of came out of you know, the Lower East Side in New York, was very urban, hardcore, edgy. And, you know, from Dirty Mind, John Prince had, had incorporated some of that in not just the way he played and the way he wrote music, but also the the appearance of, of him in the band mm-hmm. was kind of punkish and certainly was unlike any I mean, R and B was always glam. It was like you think of people like like um uh, well, like Cameo, or you, you think of Shalimar, mm-hmm. which was a hot act at the time, and the Whispers, who had hits at the time, and you know, I'm hard pressed to think of who else was 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 hot at that particular time. But Ray Parker and Radio from right. the Ghostbusters thing, and obviously the larger acts like Earth, Wind, and Fire. I mean, they were always like shiny and well dressed and had sexy outfits, and, like superheroes. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then here comes Prince with a trench coat. I mean, forget the bikini shit, but just the idea <laughs> of, the, you know, a, 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 a trench coat. And I mean, it was all, and the band was mixed and it was white and it was black. And nobody, nobody, and, and of course, Dr. Fink looked like he was somebody out of talking heads or something. It, right. it was that kind of influence that was fresh. And I think that's what caught George Clinton because goodness knows he was always the guy who did things different Mm -hmm. from everybody else. And here comes Prince who could have been his son, you know, it's like, (laughs) he's going to kind of was, he's going to rock the world and do things different than everybody else. Okay. Um, Another purple rain thing real quick. So the movie has been made. Before the movie comes out, and I know they had some test screenings. So a couple things I wanted to ask you. Mm-hmm. Did you, I'm assuming you saw the movie 
before it was released. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Did you see different versions? Of, did you hear about the whole test screening thing and all that? I heard about it, but I wasn't. I'm, I saw it screened in Minneapolis. But okay. you're right. There were test screenings in in B markets. I think one was in Colorado. Another one was in I don't know Albuquerque or Phoenix or someplace okay. in the Southwest. Well, and, and you know there were mixed results, but um, but wherever it was screened for young audiences, whether it was white or black, the response was through the roof. Wow. Okay. And that was that, that's one thing I wanted to ask again. And I'm saying before it was re- released and before that premiere party, what was the consensus or what did you guys think this movie? Did you think the movie was good? I'm asking you personally. Did you think it was like it was a good movie? And did you think it was going to be like a blockbuster? I had no way of knowing if it was going to be a blockbuster in terms of its appeal. Um, to the public, I was pretty skeptical. I have to admit. Um, I don't think anybody believed it. Nobody believed it was going to become what it what it eventually did. But you know, you say, "Did I think the movie was good?" Here, here's here's what I thought overall. If, if you want to talk about acting, no, it's not good. <laughs> um, if you want to talk about the way the performance scenes were shot, mm-hmm. it was superb. Before then, I don't think there had been any movie about rock and roll where the performance scenes were shot as realistically as these were. Okay. I mean, these scenes, and and I give great credit to Roy Bennett, who was our tour lighting director and set designer, and had no film experience, but. Prince insisted that Roy be part of that creative posse when it came to shooting the the, the uh, performance scenes and the positioning of the cameras and the way they were shot was made was was to make the audience feel like you were really in a club or a theater watching a show and feeling it and I don't think anybody had ever really accomplished that. Um, in a rock and roll movie before. So that's what impressed me. And I said, my God, now here's the, here's the situation. You had a public, most of whom had never seen him perform. Mm -hmm. He had his fan base. Yeah. We could play markets like Detroit and Chicago at the end of the 1999 tour and sell out an arena. So that's 12,000 people. But, you know, how many people are there in Chicago? Five million? Three million? I don't know. It's definitely in the millions. So 12,000 people out of several million, you know, that's that's bupkis. It's nothing. So uh, I'm I'm thinking, like, whoever sees these performance scenes could be somebody who maybe they have a Prince record, maybe they don't. But if you see these performance scenes, it's going to knock your socks off. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think eventually that's that's what happened is 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 the world basically discovered this incredible performer out of, you know, that's what they got out of this movie. Is, yeah. is 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 the movie brought the exposure to him that otherwise without the movie it might have taken him five years mm. and you know this movie in 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 one week um, exposed him to such a huge audience and I mean, you know, the shit was hot. You couldn't right. do it. Right? It was like, if you saw it, you're going gonna, you're gonna to be like, it was like the first time I saw Prince, which was on the controversy tour. And it's like, my jaw dropped. It was like, I knew the guy had some talent, but God damn. You know? <laughs> that's what I'm talking and, about. And I think that, that's what happened to the movie, um, is, is there was this whole audience of, of people who perhaps didn't listen to black radio and weren't really familiar with his catalog yet, and they were just overwhelmed. Mm. And mm. that's what the movie was, was. You know, let's face it, it was an hour and a half music video. Right. Okay. 
at a time when the format hadn't been overexposed and and um, you know it was just like the best calling card an artist could ever have wow the the success that came with uh purple rain uh you being inside of the the camp did you see a change uh in how people acted or how you know did the work environment get different after the success did it have any effect on that um certainly people changed you, you, you had to but it, but it wasn't it wasn't major i don't i don't think um I don't think so much people changed as as what they had to do changed because nobody had ever been part of a tour like that except maybe the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the, the idea that we would go into a city and basically just park there, you know, usually a tour is constantly moving. And that's what that's what everybody in that camp was accustomed to in 1999. You played Chicago one night, you got on the bus and you played Detroit the next night. You got on the bus, you played Cleveland the night after that. You just kept rolling. But. Purple Rain Tour didn't roll. Purple Rain Tour <laughs> came to town and parked. I mean, you know, we played what I think eight nights in 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 Cobo Arena or Joe Louis Arena in Detroit, wow. and you know five nights in Philly, and you know a week in New York, and it, it was just like we paid the buses to just sit in the parking lot for six days. It wow. was crazy. Um, and of, of course, the, the, the dimensions of the tour and the set required a huge crew. So we had, you know, I think it was five or six semis on the road at least. And wow. several buses, of course, a bus, you know, several buses for the band and bus for the crew. A lot of times we flew, we chartered flights because it was, it was just not cost effective to have tour buses because we weren't moving often enough. We were moving mm -hmm. like once a week. So we would call Delta Airlines and charter a jet and just put it, put everybody, the bands, the crew, and wow. the entire outfit on a, on a, on a regular Delta jet and fly to the next town. Um, well, when you get to this point, has the, how many more people, is there more people now working behind the scenes? Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I, I, and, and, and I want to say, of course the, the support was, was Sheila E at the time. Yeah. So it was her band and her crew and it was our band and our crew. Yeah. And I think the the production crew was probably in the neighborhood of 50 people. Mm. Um, wow. I'm guessing it could have been more. That's, okay. So this is a big tour. This was the it's big, big, the big tour. pop tour. The big pop big, tour. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about something, you know, on the level of a Springsteen or Rolling Stones right. or something at that level. And it was it was a huge jump from 1999 tour to this. Mm -hmm. And none of us had ever been part of anything. I mean, e even my years with James Brown which were part of his peak years, um, you know, we'd play arenas and sell out and we're happy to sell out and then move to the next town. And, you know, certainly the crowd response that James Brown would get could be overwhelming. I mean, you're talking about a superstar in an arena. But when the lights went out on the Purple Rain tour, the noise from the audience was so loud Mm. that we started wearing earplugs. It, it, I mean, I'd never experienced anything like it. it. It was like, I'll never forget the first show, which was in Detroit. And I was on the edge of the stage um, having just, you know, made sure everybody in the band was cool, that they had what they needed, that they were plugged up, everything was, you know, ready to go. And when the house lights went down, the whole band had expressions like, holy cow, what the hell is this? <laughs> because the, the response was just, wow. I mean, it, it was it was beyond extra. It was just something nobody had ever heard before. It was frightening. That's got, I mean, just think of all those people on the arena and they're there to see you and 
boom, you're put on, you're on the biggest stage. I, I can only imagine what that uh, must have felt. Uh, one thing I want to ask you about the the parade tour, and we've talked about this on the podcast before. What if would, would that tour have happened if the time was the opening act? Like, what do you what do you think would have happened if they were the opening act? Well, by then there was no time. Right. Um, I mean, if if the time has, if the original group with Jimmy and Terry had stayed together, and I mean, I mean, we have to. There's like, like, I mean, this is all fantasy now. Sure. <laughs> but but let let's say they stayed together and stayed with Prince. I don't think that had much of a future because the the the, the people more Jesse. Um, particularly Morris, Jesse, and obviously Jam and Lewis all had ideas to create music of their own and wanted to kind of be independent of Prince. They didn't want to be just Prince's alter ego with him writing all the music, playing most of it on their records. I mean, they, they, there was a part of them that kind of felt like they were fake because here's mm -hmm. here's this guy who's basically writing, producing, and even playing most of the instruments on the records that 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 said the time, you know. Um, you know, Morris's vocals, of course, were on the records. Jesse would play a couple of guitar solos on the records, but most and, and Bean might play some drums on a track or two. But basically, those records were all prints. So imagine that you're Morris Day or, or Jimmy Jam and Terry, who had these ideas of writing your own music, producing your own ideas. Um, and Prince wasn't going to let you do that. Because mm. this was this was his project, and he was very protective of it, and and you know he he wasn't going to allow them the kind of creative input that they would have have wanted as 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 their ambitions grew. So that's one for instance. Now the second for instance, it's let's say they stayed together, Jam and Lewis included, and broke away from Prince. Mm -hmm. and went their own way, but continued as the time, then goodness only knows what might have happened if Jam and Lewis had become the writers for the time mm -hmm. and, and the bands had started making their own records with all of them playing on the records. Um, it would have been really, really interesting to see what would have happened because there was an enormous amount of talent there. Right. Yeah. And a killer band. So, you know, we were all kind of robbed of that opportunity, which is too bad, because if they had stayed together and had the freedom to do their own thing as a group, um, sky was the limit. Yeah, I think they all reached their, their skies. Different, yeah, I mean, different they, they, they all found their place. There's no question. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, you can't really second guess. I mean, it's just kind of like that was just that was just, the, you know, that was fate. That's I mean, right. everybody. Everybody ends up where they're supposed to be. So mm -hmm. if, okay. if you follow that kind of logic, then, then it's, it's all good. And of course, they've all had great careers. Um, but but it certainly would have been musically interesting to see what sure. would have happened if if they had stayed together and Jam and Lewis's great creativity had contributed to that band. Mm, that would be crazy. Because I mean, these guys went off and started writing gazillions of hits. Right. For, you know how many other artists? So if they had been writing for Morris in the time, you know who knows what would have happened. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and this will date this podcast when everybody hears it later. But I just saw that they're going to put out their first, very first debut Jam and Lewis album with them as the artists, which should be interesting. Yeah, uh, so I've heard. Yeah. Um, at, so Purple Rain, phenomenal success. Uh, I, and moving on to like Around the World in a Day and other other things. Does Prince, and that's what I was going to ask you earlier, who communicates with Prince? Does he like tell you and can talk with you about things or he just stick with his manager and then they talk to you? I was curious how that worked. Like who had Prince's ear doing all this as he's becoming this even bigger artist? Well, I, cer I certainly did. Um, 
you know, once I got to Minneapolis, I mean, we, we already knew each other from the 1999 tour, so he was comfortable. Well, he's the one who said to hire me, so obviously he was comfortable with me. Um, and, you know, very much I, I was his ear. I mean, whenever he wanted or needing it, needed anything, my phone rang. Now, this is, you know, before cell phones, so it was about you know, landlines and answering machines, old school technology. But I mean, he was ringing the phone in my apartment constantly. You know, Alan, can you do this? Alan, can you get that? I mean, it never, it never stopped. Um, and, and of course, his managers, um, when it came to the, the, the level of, of business that required him talking to his managers, but really, to be honest, my gig, you know, Farnoli called it a, a, an off-road road manager. But quite honestly, what it really was, was a liaison between Prince and his management. Okay. Because they, Prince wanted Farnoli to move to Minneapolis full time. Now, mind you, that Farnoli and Bob Cavallo and Joe Ruffalo, their partners, um, had a big suite of offices in LA. They also managed Earth, Wind, and Fire. They managed Little Feet. Um, they managed Ray Parker. They had other artists, and um, you know, we're an established management company. They weren't going to relocate to Minneapolis because mm -hmm. of one artist, even if he did become their biggest artist. They, you know, these were California guys. They don't want to live here. Right. So I think the Farnoli's idea, his hidden agenda was like, okay, I can trust leads, Prince trust leads, so let's put him there as our representative, and he'll be like kind of the, the, the management person on site so that, you know, Farnoli and Cavallo could stay in their offices in L.A. and, and miss out on our bad weather in the winters. Interesting. Okay. Um, with that, well, then with that said – when uh, I'm just kind of jumping to some of these these points, but getting to Under the Cherry Moon in, in that movie, does, does Prince tell you about, hey, I want to do this movie? And then it goes to his managers. I was just curious, like, what was the process uh, at that? Well, I, th I think the initial conversations were with Farnoli, Cavallo, Ruffalo and Farnoli, because anytime he wanted to do a movie, of course, they had to find the funding. And, you know, some film company who's going to be willing to back it and support the kind of film talent, you know, cinematographers and, and so on mm. and so on, the, the kind of technical people that were necessary. So that conversation would have been with his managers, but it's not like he wouldn't have told us. He'd be like, hey, I'm, I'm ready to make another movie. You know, I mean, he's, he's going to, you know, I mean, we were together like all the time because he was always rehearsing the band. So there was always a reason for us to be together. He never stopped creating. And there were always things he wanted or needed. So, you know, in those conversations, he would certainly discuss what his plans were. Was he when he discussed with his managers? Was does he more tell them this is what I want to do? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like he's like, I want to do this, make it happen, type of thing. Yeah, he, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, <laughs> Prince wasn't somebody who was going to ask anybody. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. <laughs> you know, when, when it came to his aspirations as an artist, whether it was making an album or a film or a video, um, it all started with him. Mm. Okay, and and I mean there were certain people who had creative input. Don't misunderstand me. Um, he he would discuss things with Farnoli. Farnoli would would make suggestions, creative suggestions. Um, and, you know, Prince would either listen to him or dismiss him. <laughs> and Roy <laughs> Bennett, um, Roy Bennett certainly had influence on Prince in terms of the set designs for the mm. tours we took on the road. And um, and eventually there were a few musicians, um, Wendy, Lisa, Sheila E., and my brother, the four of them come to mind as musicians that were part of his posse that, that he didn't take directions from, but he would talk to them about music and get ideas. Mm, okay. 
So they, they certainly had some influence on him. Was there, uh, d- during this time when, you know, the band is sort of fluctuating and the Sheila E's band is, is there, um, you know, the, the revolution and the bands in terms of the performance changes to more, you know, if you go from Purple Rain style and then you jump to the parade show, you know, more of a funk right. soul type of thing. Mm-hmm. I've heard some of the musicians talk about this, but from your perspective, what did you think of Prince sort of changing it to go into more funk, torpor, you know, heavy funk type thing? I, I know you love black music and stuff. It's like, what did you think about that show as it was coming together, the parade show? Oh, I was loving it. I, I mean, to me, that was, that was the bomb. That was my, <laughs> you know, if it was up to me, he'd be doing that all the time. <laughs> um, because that, that, that's, you know, that's just that's just where I lived musically. I mean, it, it got to be kind of a running gag once we later on, once we had Pam, I'm, I'm fast forwarding for a minute, once Paisley Park was up and running and I had regular office hours there, was, you know, basically working 10 to 6 or 7 or 8 or however late at night and get out of there. And he'd be in the recording studio downstairs. Um, they're probably half a dozen times where he might ring my office phone and say, hey, you want to hear something new? And I'd go down into the studio and he would only call me down for the funkier stuff. <laughs> if, if he was creating a rock song, he didn't bother to call me. Oh, really? because, because he, you know, he, he, you know, we talked music. He knew where I lived. He knew, he knew what was up. <laughs> um, he wasn't going to, you know, there were just certain things he wasn't going to call me, call me for my opinion. But if, but if it was something on the funk side, he'd be like, yo, come on, you know, come on down and hear this. Wow. Um, but but going back to your question, yeah, I, I thought the parade thing was right on time because he had it, it was kind of st- stripped down everything was stripped down mm-hmm. and the the you know garish costumes and the crazy theatrics and everything that we had done on the purple rain tour and of course around the world in the day didn't get a tour but but it had music videos that were you know pretty ambitious artistically and you know he had, he had been through so much that it was kind of like, okay, maybe it is time to just get back to the music for a minute. And, uh, you know, the music for Parade was his most sophisticated, most interesting music up to that point. Um, Not necessarily the most successful commercially, but I think artistically it showed Mm -hmm. development. And and it also took him back to his roots because there was some funky shit there. So (laughs) it, it, it was like... Also, it, it, it took advantage of the band and the fact that now he had added the trumpet player along with my brother. Right. So now there was a horn element to the band that kind of took it back to, you know, the funk of Pete Funk or even James Brown, in fact, because up until then, he never had horns. And it was it was part of the distinct sound that, you know, his use of keyboard horns, which was sonically so much different than what we were used to from the bands like, you know, like Earth, Wind. And, right. You know, all the bands that had that had serious horn sections. So the idea that he now had a serious horn section also added a new new dynamic. And he decided to straighten his hair back and put on suits instead of crazy yeah. outfits. And, you know, the bikini underwear and the trench coats were gone. And it was like, oh, shit, Prince grew up. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was like, that's what I saw when I looked at the stage. It was like, right. OK, now we've grown up here. Now it's really about the music. It isn't about the movie. It isn't about all these fantasies that teenage girls have. <laughs> now it's down to like grown up music. And and I thought that was a I thought that was an important phase for him. I mean, beside the fact that I personally liked it, who cares? It was an important phase for him creatively Mm -hmm. to grow through that and kind of show the world that like, yeah, I can be grown up and still rock your socks. Um, You know, this isn't I'm not a passing fad because what we discovered was there were there were millions of Purple Rain fans 
who never really became Prince fans, mm. meaning that a lot of them to this day mm-hmm. may only have one Prince album in the house, and that's still Purple Rain, right. because they were just in love with that and what it represented to young kids at that time, because, um, you know, it sold, you know, 20 some million units. And um, the rest of his albums never approached those numbers. So what happened to that other 15, 18 million people that bought Purple Rain? Well, they were fans of the movie. They were fans of the fantasy. They Mm. were fans of that music. But they weren't real Prince fans. Once the movie died down, they were gone. They were on to something else. Hmm. So I'm saying parade is 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 leading towards increasing his fan base into people that are really into him for the music. Wow. And not the fantasies and everything else that Purple Rain presented, because a lot of people lived through that movie, Purple Rain, Mm -hmm. and really were into it, you know, beyond just the music, but were really into the lyrical content. But more importantly, the way people were dressed, the way they danced, um, the whole cultural idea of having having things that that, that 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 weren't sexist or racist in the sense that you had blacks and whites, males and females all partying together, you know, that was that was still kind of fresh and it represented a lot culturally that Purple Rain captured. It really captured a moment in teenage America that was wasn't about black or white. It was just about young people who were looking for something to to hold on to and purple rain was it and once they outgrew that phase of their lives they were on to something else wow so we had to recognize that there were there were purple rain fans but they were not necessarily all prince fans and and come to earth with that fact and be realistic about what his what his fan base really was and parade was a way to do that and, and what about in the, in the movie Under the Cherry Moon? I'm sure you saw that movie before it came out again. At that, when you saw that movie before it was released, <clears throat> working in that camp, you know, whatever you may have told people what you thought about it, how did you really think about that movie when you, when you first saw it? I, it's hard to say because that was a case where because we were on location and shot you know, for the three months of the shooting was all in the south of France. And we were all there. We rented villas and were living there and and spent three months in the south of France. And as a result, I saw the dailies every mm. day. Okay. In other words, every day after after shooting, you'd go to a screening room and you would see rough cuts of what had been shot the day before. And, you know, when you're making a movie, you don't shoot it in sequence. Right. So you might see something from the, you might, one day you would be seeing a scene from the beginning of the movie. The next day you'd see a scene from the end of the movie. Next day you'd see a scene from the, from the middle of the movie. So you didn't have any way to, to, to look at this, these, what they call dailies and get any big picture of what the movie was going to end up being. Um, What I knew was that it was a really daring idea and that some of the scenes were, I mean, the the stuff with Jerome and Prince were, you know, there were some funny scenes. There were some Mm -hmm. good stuff, but the overall stuff when it started, you know, it was like, it was, I I was like, okay, this is going to be a stretch. (laughs) And and it's, it's going to require a really good editor. And once I saw the finished product, I was like, okay, I'm too close to this because I was there for the shooting and I know the people involved and, Mm. but this is not Prince's best moment. Mm. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about the stuff with Prince and and Jerome. Did you guys ever think like, man, he's doing Morris, or maybe, you know, he's yeah. doing the Morris type thing? Yeah, but I, I think what you have to really say is that when you go back to Morris, Morris was doing Prince. Exactly, exactly. 
It was always Prince. That was the problem with the time, is they were all Prince. <laughs> Morris was acting the way Prince wanted him to act. It was the way Prince would act when he was playing around with friends. When you're just sitting around watching videos, Prince would act like that sometimes. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that was Prince. Okay. It was Morris <laughs> being Prince. Wow. So. You know, that, that, as I said, that was the whole problem was these guys had no identity of their own. They felt like frauds. Mm. God, that's just a weird dichotomy. So so now you've gone full cycle and he's doing Cherry Moon with Jerome and he's actually doing, yeah, he was doing Morris, but it was Morris doing Prince. Prince. Wow. <laughs> um, that tour, I remember when it came out, I was young at the time. I was not able to travel, but I remember hearing about some of the shows and I, there wasn't as much. I mean, that was the MTV days. So you kind of only got to see what was shown there. And I was blown away, blown away by the pieces of it that I could see off of TV, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly the uh, when Prince uh, came on that Sheila E. home video where they do uh, Love Bazaar. Oh, right. <laughs> that's right. One of them, that's mm -hmm. so classic. Um, why didn't that tour, why wasn't that a bigger tour in the States? I, I mean, he was Prince, one of the biggest acts out there. For, for some reason, and, and of course we can't ask him now, but only he really knows the answer. He decided not to take that, that on tour in the States. We played a few cities just as warm-ups, but it was, it was basically a European tour, only a European tour. And... Um, I'm not sure why. It, it it may have had something to do with the fact that the movie didn't do what, you know, didn't become what Prince wanted it to become. Okay. And, uh, you know, maybe he felt that the next big tour in the States would have to be something on a much bigger scale because Parade was really stripped down. I mean, right. there, there wasn't much of a set. Um it was a pretty modest tour, and I, th I think Prince, I think Prince believed that what he did in the states was going to have to compete with Purple Rain. Hmm. That he wanted his next tour in the states to be something like the Purple Rain tour, which meant it was going to have to be a huge production with a huge set. And of course, eventually that happened with the Love Sexy tour, which is exactly what that was—a a right. huge tour, right? And so I, I, I think he just didn't have confidence in touring the states with Parade, which was, which was disappointing to a lot of us because the message kind of was like. Okay, just having dope music isn't enough. Mm. It, it's it's got to be a production. It's got to be something huge. And we were like, no, man, let the music speak for itself. Just just let this be the anti tour, and and let's just go out and rock people. And then you can come back the following year and do one of your big productions. But you know, the stripped down idea, shit, this is working. Let's let's go with it. Mm -hmm. But he he didn't he didn't want to do it. Wow, yeah, because the band was was smoking, man. <clears throat> Them shows, influential. Uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah if, go ahead. If, if, if you talk to Eric, and I can't speak for the rest of the band, but if you talk to Eric, he'll tell you in a heartbeat that was his favorite tour. Really? A uh, parade, okay. Okay. Um, and so we going into, and you know, I hesitate to go deep into this section because there's so much information about this album because it's just being released, Sign of the Times, which you should go get if you, you all, we already got it. Uh, you, you go into a big period here, though, where you have the Dream Factory, uh, you know, Breakup of the Revolution, Crystal Ball. Uh, what was your role during this period? Uh, for Prince, were you still doing? He'd call you up. Hey, I need this. Or how did you have a title yeah, I, now? A different title? No, it was it was tour manager, and I don't know. I mean, people have variously called me vice president of Paisley Park and this and that. And, and of course, once I took over the label, I had a title that was related to that. But I was I was just I was just Prince's guy. I mean, it was like the company was growing. Certainly, I was the figurehead. Um, you know, again, still the liaison between 
Prince and his management. So I was the management when Farnoli wasn't there. I was I was the man. So, you know, it, it, the job responsibility still was any and everything that involves Prince's day to day activities. Um, now, you know, he was always writing music, always recording new songs and always rehearsing the band. I mean, the band would come and we would do rehearsals even when there was no tour. I mean, he just loved to play. So mm-hmm. he would bring the band in five days a week and and work on new songs that he had recorded that maybe would never even get released. But the band would learn them and then quickly forget him because he'd replace them <laughs> with something else. So, you know, everybody was part of that process as he was turning out all of this new music that, as you say, first was Dream Factory. It was Camille. It was all these different ideas and, you know, like most creative people, he would change his mind. But until he would change his mind, he would be, you know, hot to go. So, I mean, Dream Factory, there was a, there was even an album cover designed mm-hmm. and pictures taken. And, and I mean, it was a serious project that wow. everybody was down for. And then one day he comes in and says, OK, forget that. We're on to the next. Um and wow. you just, you know, you just shake your head and say, OK, but um, no, there was, believe me, it was a very busy period, even though we weren't touring, just because he was always doing something. And, you know, there were, by, by then, music videos had become a big thing. So we were mm. always thinking about music videos and where we're going to shoot them and who's going to be in them. And I mean, there was always logistical stuff. What did what did you think of the sound of his music at this particular time? When you know the the Dream Factory and Crystal Ball stuff, what did you think of the music that you heard? To, to you know, I, I mean, the personal taste is is you know every <laughs> everybody has it. So I don't think mine is any more important than anybody <laughs> else's. But I but having said that, to me that was his most creative, interesting period. Um, and that includes some of the songs that were outtakes that I fell in love with back then and still crazy about and, you know, was always, always disappointed that songs like Power Fantastic mm. and in, in the Room With No Light mm. um, and I can probably if I had the list of the Sign of the Times outtakes, I could probably come up with a couple more that I felt should have been released back then in some form but they didn't fit his concept for the albums and you know he was the artist so i mean you had to respect that but he he was just creating music on such a high level and it was coming out of him like 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 a leaky faucet i mean it's not a very pleasant description but i i always said he had studio diarrhea (laughs) it it just couldn't stop the music just kept coming and i don't think he could stop it 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 was some other force and you know i don't want to get in religion and all of that but there was some other force going on there man because it was just pouring out of him at a rate that was I mean, it was ridiculous. It was like he was writing a, a, a masterpiece every day. Wow. Mm-hmm. And you would just, just, and, and everybody was just shaking their heads. And then he would, you know, he would go off and I mean, he would never sleep, which was, you know, to everybody else's chagrin because <laughs> our phones were ringing 24 seven. Every time he'd get an idea, it was like, didn't matter what time it was, let's act on it. Um, but it, it 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 was like no everybody was just holding on trying to keep up with him, and it was understandable that what became sign of the times had gone through so many phases because there was so much music. And how in the world do you compile it into what would be a cohesive album that makes sense as an album? Um, I mean, he was. And then he would do things like like he'd be in L.A. to record and suddenly he would say, call Levi, call Sheila, call Eric, call Wendy. Let's I want to jam tonight. Then he'd go in the studio and they, they'd record like like all this instrumental jazzy stuff that was all improvisational. 
And some of that stuff ended up on on Eric's first solo album that, mm-hmm. that originally was going to be a Madhouse album. I mean, mm-hmm. but all of this music was pouring out of Prince. Yes. This was all at the same time. And it, it was just all you could do was just shake your head and try to keep up with him. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're talking about well, there's what. Well, let me ask you this. Um, the first Madhouse album, uh, Eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I remember when that came out, and I didn't know who it was. I, I just seen something on it was on MTV. It was MTV News, and I think he mentioned that Prince had something to do with it or something. And I was like, I gotta go get it, and fell in love with that record. What did, what did you guys? What was the the thought of Madhouse to do? Like, did it just we're just gonna put it out there and see what happens? Uh, I'm just curious. What was the thought at that time around the camp of Madhouse? You know that that's that's probably more of an Eric question because I'm not sure. Without again, I didn't take my memory pills today. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what started that. I'm not sure where that came from. The idea to do it. Um. But, of course, once it was done, I mean, this was my brother. So, obviously, I was down with it. It was like, <laughs> okay, that's going to help his career. You okay. know, so just 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 from a personal level, I was very happy with the idea that, that he was going to be indulged by Prince to have a project like this. I mean, nobody else in Prince's bands had ever been, mm. you know, uh, 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 given that kind of an opportunity. So, you know, I never thought about it like that, but that's absolutely remarkable. I mean, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, it, it, huh. I'm not so sure that the rest of the band was that happy with the idea because they're kind of like, okay, if, if Eric's got Madhouse, you know, I suppose Wendy's thinking, where's Wendy's house? You know, where, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, can't blame her for that, right? <laughs> Hilarious, <laughs> man. Because uh, I mean, Eric came into the band. It was, it was, you know, it was very awkward for me because, you know, I, I had, you know, turned Prince on to Eric in the first place. They were looking for a sax player for Sheila E. Mm. Before she found Eddie M., she was looking for a sax player. So I just happened to say to them both once at a rehearsal, "Well, my brother's a hell of a sax player." Um. And, and Prince was like, really? And, and I said, yeah, no joke, because he's my brother. Dude can play. And he was <laughs> like, well, get me a tape. So Eric sent up a tape of, I don't know what was on the tape, but um, um, at the time he was living in Atlanta and he had been he had been spending his time with Gary Scheider and people like that just jamming. So, you know, you know, he and he had, you know, played with the James Brown band for a hot minute. So, you know, he had his funk credentials. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he's whatever tape he sent, I gave it to Sheila, gave it to Prince. In the meantime, she had found Eddie M. So all mm-hmm. of a sudden she didn't need a sax player. But Eric was like, holy, I mean, Prince was like, holy shit, this dude is bad. You know, bring him up here anyway. And um so originally, Eric was here to be part of the family, and that was actually that project had started before the Purple Rain tour. But once the Purple Rain tour was out for a while, Prince decided to just invite Eric to come out and hang out for a week. Well, of course, mm-hmm. by the end of the week, he was on stage with the on with the encore. Then the week later, Prince gave him and the wardrobe department make some kind of outfit for him so he so he'd fit in. So all of a sudden, if you if you if you look at the last month of the Purple Rain tour. Eric was on stage with the revolution every night for the last month or so. Mm. Now he would only play on three or four songs and he was always kind of in the back. Mm. So, but you know, the band was like, what the fuck is this? He wasn't in purple rain in a horn. Mm. And all of a sudden Prince is calling for a sax solo when we play a certain song, not the purple rain music, but other stuff. And, um, there was even a gig in California where at the beginning of Purple Rain, before Prince came out, when Wendy is playing the intro, he told Eric to go up front and do a sax solo. And, and Eric 
killed the house. I mean, it was you know perfect opportunity to do something really funky and pretty. And Eric pulled out his Maceo ideas and 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 rocked it. But Wendy's looking at him like, "Who the fuck are you?" You know, mm. <laughs> because it was like you know the revolution had this very tight knit idea. They had made the movie. They felt like they were a self contained band. I don't think they they really they had kind of forgotten that they were they were basically sidemen to a superstar right and there's mm. nothing wrong with that this isn't a put down but they kind of because of the way it was marketed because of the way prince treated them they kind of felt like a self-contained band like they're the new beatles so the idea mm. that somebody knew it was like no you can't be part of this this is a close knit team that we're supposed to stay together forever and nobody else is supposed to be able to get in here. Mm. And all of a sudden here comes somebody and he gets solo space because he's a saxophonist and there's no horn parts. The only thing for him to do would be to play solos and Prince is all of a sudden calling, Hey, Eric play. And, and nobody else in the band was getting solo right. space. like that. Interesting. So, you know, I think at first there was real jealousy. And of course, I'm the tour manager of the band. Now I'd been with them for, you know, two, three years. We had our own relationships and he's my brother. So they don't mm. want to say things to me that they would probably say if, if, if Eric had been an outsider and had not been my brother, had been Maceo or somebody, some, any other horn player, the band would have been very comfortable confiding in me the fact that they didn't like the idea of having another musician around. Hmm. But they, they couldn't say that to me now because it was my brother. Right. So it, it was an awkward position. Do you Probably think Prince picked up on any of this? No, he didn't care. He just wanted what he wanted. Hmm. Interesting. You know, he was he was pretty cold blooded about that. It's like this is what I want to hear right now, so I don't care what anybody thinks. Was that that's interesting? You say that is that uh, was that a, a thing that you knew everybody knew? Like it didn't matter what we thought. He is whatever he says. Sure. Mm. Yeah, that was abundantly clear. I mean, all you had to do was be at one rehearsal and see how he talked to the band. I mean, it was, it was, you know, I, I mean, don't misunderstand me. He was friendly. He was down with the band. He would talk music with them. He respected them. But he and would, they respected him. But when it came to who's the boss, right. there was never any question. And you better come to rehearsal knowing your parts. I mm. mean, if, if, if a rehearsal ended today and he told everybody, go home and learn five songs, you better come in the next day with those five songs. Man, what happens to what, what happened to the person that didn't didn't know they shit? Then he would call you out. I mean, he would really make you feel stupid. But he like play the instrument in front of you and play your part or something? Yeah, he would play your part and say, this is what you're supposed to play. Now you're going to learn to play it. You know, and, and, and I mean, he could he could he could cut to your heart. He was he could be don't play the dozens with Prince. because He, don't lose. <laughs> <laughs> he reminds I, again, I never per personally met him like that, but just looking at and listening all the years. I could see he reminds me of a part. I could see like he could have that what I would call that black, that black daddy. Like boy, don't don't raise your voice. You know, I could see him. He seemed like he was a kind of guy behind the scenes. Like if he wasn't on point, it was almost like a stern drill sergeant. Yeah, black exactly. mother. You know, he'd be on your ass about it. exactly, exactly. And and talk about your faults and your mama. <laughs> he held nothing back. I mean, I mean, he could really, really make a musician feel embarrassed and stupid in front of the other musicians. Wow. And um, and everybody had their own way of dealing with it, you know. I mean, because if every listen, none of us are perfect. We're all going to make mistakes, and goodness knows he was the same way with the crew. I mean, if his guitar wasn't properly tuned, pity the poor guitar tech. Um, you know, he'd call you out in the middle middle of the stage in front of the whole band, and um, you know, it was he was a perfectionist, and he expected everybody else to keep up with him. Mm. It was just that simple. What what did uh, 
What did, how did you feel about when, you know, he let the revolution go and then as he's working with other new musicians coming into the, what did you think of the band and just how that went down and everything? Well, again, my opinion is biased. You know, I have, I have a disclaimer because my brother was part of that. And, you know, he benefited from it happening. So obviously I had a personal interest in it from that aspect. But if we can set that aside for a minute, I still thought it was a great idea. And, and the reason was the revolution was great at what they did. But they weren't really going to take him further. Prince was somebody who had had the sky was the the limit for his potential as an artist. It was obvious once you'd sat at a rehearsal and listened to him jam for a half an hour, you realized that you just realized that his talent was so beyond anything that had been on on the records. And, and that includes Purple Rain. I mean, Purple Rain was a brilliantly, forget the movie for a minute, it was a brilliantly crafted pop album that had a lot of funky elements to it that would appeal to a, a black audience as well. But it was a brilliantly crafted album. Mm -hmm. But that, what that told you was the potential was like, beyond and, and it was like okay he needs to be around a variety of musicians that can support him as he matures mm. you, you you can't put a third grade student in kindergarten and expect him to grow mm. and and it was kind of like okay he's really outgrowing this unit now it doesn't mean the individual musicians aren't capable it just means he needs more he needs things that the original five revolution cannot provide him. And part of that was horns. Part of that was the percussion and rhythmic intensity. Now, the rhythmic, rhythmic variety that Sheila could bring because of her background in Latin music and jazz. She had toured with George Duke and Herbie Hancock, for goodness sake. So she brought the experience of that music mm -hmm. into the in, 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 into the room. And, and these were just things that the original five musicians weren't going to provide. I mean, Lisa brought a, 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 a portal uh, knowledge as a, as a keyboard player in a sense, sense of chords and, and, and things that a lot of rock and roll musicians didn't have because she had been classically trained. Wendy had been musically trained and had some good ideas. Um, and, and as far as the other musicians, they were great at what they did. But you really wanted to see Prince surrounded by an environment that would encourage and allow him to grow that could keep up with him. Mm -hmm. And that's why I felt it was important that, that he expand his uh, – his uh, group of musicians. And, and I think there's no question he benefited from that. For sure. For sure. I was just thinking, like, you mentioned Wendy, and I'm thinking, yeah, but then, then Miko came along. I'm like, man, that dude is a monster at what he does. <laughs> So. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Miko was, was was one of the best rhythm guitar players in the history of the music. He doesn't get the credit he deserves because no, he, he, he was never really featured and, and, you know, didn't didn't have the exposure that he should have had. But I mean, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to rhythm guitar, he's right up there with Country Kellum, who played with James Brown and maybe some of the P-Funk guys. I mean, Miko's a beast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I still got so much. Let me go here. The Black Album. From your perspective, when you, whenever you heard it and you guys knew it, it was going to be a product until he said otherwise, as you said. <laughs> but what did you think of that album? And did you think it was necessary for him to be doing that? And what I mean by that was, I'm assuming that album is sort of like a response back to has Prince lost his blackness or his funk or something like that. Right. Uh, so I'm curious from you got your point of view. What did you think of that whole situation? Um, I didn't really get it as an album. I mean, you know, there's some funky stuff there. There's no question. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't, but as an album, I, I, I just didn't think it was as good as, as, as a Prince album should have been. I didn't, I didn't think it held up. Now, it's important to realize that that was a crossroads for him because of the advent and crossover of hip hop into mainstream culture. Um, for the first time in Prince's career, he was no longer at the cutting edge. Mm-hmm. Love Sexy had not been as successful as he had wanted it to be. It was kind of a weird record that people didn't understand. Um, great tour, but the album wasn't what it should have been or what he thought it should have been. So he was kind of like, okay, where do I go from here? You know, um, what's what's next for Prince? And I don't think he really had an answer. He wasn't, wasn't, it was the first time he was he was puzzled. He didn't didn't really have a focus of what should be his next step. And of course, he's reading this, you know, the backlash, as you suggested, of him having sold out and not not uh, tending to his black audience, his base. So I think that certainly is why he made the album. But, you know, he had the epiphany and decided that it was doing the record for the wrong reason and canceled it. And, you know, I, I think the album is much more famous because it was canceled than, being, than for what the music was. I mean, it's 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 like, you know, it's a cool little record. Right. Don't understand me. But but, you know, it, it, if it if it had come out the way it was intended originally as a Prince album. Um, I don't know that we'd be talking about it today as anything important. I mean, he was, you know, he was trying in his own way to recognize hip hop, but you know, that, that was unfortunately something he really didn't relate to. It took him a long time to get it because it wasn't his, you know, I hate to say this, but as a white person, but I don't know if I have the right to say it, but it, it wasn't it wasn't his area of black culture when hip hop came up. I mean, he, I he, had, he didn't live in the Bronx. Right. You know, yeah, he came from the hood in Minneapolis, but, you know, the hood in Minneapolis was like, you know, a little different <laughs> great school compared to the Bronx. Right. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it just wasn't wasn't a culture that he came from and that in and of course as somebody who was so 24 7 driven to be the perfectionist he was um as a musician and and tending to his voice so that when he sang it was a hundred percent what people expected and um protecting the range of his voice and all the things that went into preserving the talent he was and you know, the idea that somebody who couldn't sing or play could have a hit record and went the hell out of him. <laughs> it was like, how dare they, you know? Uh, I'm jumping ahead here, but Love Sexy, fabulous concert tour. I got to see that one myself. Uh, after that, though, and I'm curious, for, in, during this period, what is Prince's relationship and I guess as you being the conduit between the management at this time, is he feeling like he doesn't need management? What causes this, the reason for the split that you know? Of? Um, it was real simple that the, the Love Sexy project, including the U.S. tour, wasn't the success that he had wanted it to be. Um, unlike the Purple Rain tour, which now remember, he hadn't toured the States since Purple Rain. Right. Um, he, had, you know, he had done one-off shows, but but he hadn't toured the states, and uh, that meant that the Sign of the Times tour, which of course there was a video that people saw, etc., didn't tour the states. So the first real tour he had done in the states since Purple Rain was Love Sexy, and whereas I told you before, Purple Rain we would park in a city for a week, Love Sexy was more like a traditional tour. It was, mm. you know, maybe two shows in the big markets, but it was about, you know, we sell out one show and move on. I think we did two or three in New York, but not six. 
And this is a bigger production. This is probably his biggest production ever, right? In terms of the yeah, it's show. absolutely yeah. the biggest production ever. And because the show was in the round, meaning it played in the middle of the floor of the arenas instead of at one end, um, the production took up the space of, of what normally would have been seats you could sell. Mm-hmm. So let's say the normal capacity for a concert in Madison Square Garden, I'm just going to make, a, a, for example, make up some numbers. Let's say the normal capacity is 13,000 seats. Well, for this show, it's down to maybe 10,000 because we had to kill a lot of seats to make room for all the props, the staging um, in the center of the building. So from a financial standpoint, it wasn't so smart. And the tour didn't make money. I mean, it was just just simple. At the end of the road, um, the expenses being what they were, the tour was not successful Mm. from a a business standpoint. And Prince decided to blame all of that on his management. Mm. And that actually had as much to do with the fact that he wasn't having hit singles, that the singles from the album weren't as successful as his previous singles had been. And um, he just blamed management. And he's not the only artist who's done that. that They make artistic decisions and they blame management for the outcome. Um, I might add that the Love Sexy Tour was originally supposed to play the States first when the album came out. We were supposed to begin the States tour and then play Europe later. At the very, very last minute, Prince decided to reverse it, and he insisted that we rebook the tour to play Europe first and the States later. Um. Now, you can debate the wisdom of that, but the fact was, by the time we got on the road in the States, we had lost the opportunity to really hype the album as anything new. It had been out for three months. Mm. So it wouldn't, you know, if if we had toured the States from the very beginning, maybe that would have helped explain the album, explain the concept behind it, Mm -hmm. and, you know, bring people closer to the music on the record, might have helped the singles, um, and... um, you know, so so it was it was a kind of screwy situation. So even before we got to the states, he he and the and management were were having friction, and um, as as a liaison, I became kind of a ping pong ball because it, there was actually a point in Europe at the end of the European part of the tour where they weren't speaking. Really? Yeah. Farnoli was so angry at being blamed for things that Prince had, dis- had made the decision for being blamed for the results of Prince's own decisions. And um, I don't know what was said between them that, that got to the point where they weren't talking. But I woke up one morning and Prince called and said, I'm not talking to Steve and I don't think he's talking to me. So would you please go tell him? Bah, 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 bum. And then Steve <laughs> would say, go tell Prince. Bah, 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 bum. So now I'm, wow. now I'm like a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a text message that just goes back and forth, you know, and that, that wasn't um, that wasn't a lot of fun. Where, um, where, was there so this is interesting like did you guys think that some of the decisions he were making like again i guess there was nobody that he would you could question him but like when he would say i don't want to do sign of the times tour in the states or cancel this album or you know i don't know if when you saw the picture of love sexy album or something do you guys were you guys like man he's just think some of these decisions he's making are wild but let's you know this is our job let's go for it or were you guys like yeah this is going to be well, great no it, it, eventually you would reach that point i mean you know it, 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 you, there's a point where you just got to try to make lemonade but but i mean we all had a huge blow up over the decision to change the love sexy tour from the states to europe first um, I mean, for a period of a couple of days, Farnoli was on the phone and I was here and we were both like Prince, man, you got to rethink this. This is not smart. This is and here's and would give him reasons. You know, I mean, yeah, you could have those conversations and he would listen. Hmm. But 
at the end of the day, once once he made the final decision, then it became your marching orders to figure out how to pull it off. And and part of the reason it was wrong is we knew the record wasn't uh, clear cut, wasn't an obvious record. It was we didn't we were against the album cover. We were against the sequencing of the record and the way the CD, um, um, you know, w- was programmed so right. that you could, just one track. It was one track, and we pointed out all that was risky about that. That anybody who was using CDs on radio by then, most of radio had 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 stopped using records and reusing CDs. And it's like, dude, radio can't program the damn record, mm. you know. Um, anybody who wanted to play an album track couldn't do it because of the, the, the sequencing was so difficult to, to manipulate. Um, and it was insulting to fans because if you buy a CD, there may be a couple. I don't care what record it is or what the artist. It could be What's Going On by Marvin Gaye, and you just don't want to hear the whole album. And so you want to sequence it as a fan the way you prefer to. You bought the record. You have a right to. So, I mean, yes, we had these arguments, Definitely had these arguments, <laughs> and um, you know there, there were there were times where where he there were arguments where we won and he would change his mind, but not that often. Usually, when he made a decision, he was just like, "I don't care what you say, make this work. That's your job, make it work." And uh, the thing with the Love Sexy tour that was was difficult is we really had a good routing that was that was going to be cost effective that made sense playing the right markets at the right time strategically with the um, dates of the the singles that were going to drop and so on to make sure we were in a major market when a single dropped um, for the media attention that you could get through MTV and so on so I mean there's strategy behind this stuff and when he said play Europe it so happened that both Madonna and Michael Jackson were also touring Europe at the very same time, mm. which means that the demand for good dates in the venues was difficult because between the Madonna tour and the Michael Jackson tour, they had all the good venues tied up. And here we come trying to squeeze into these same same months and I mean, there's only so many cities and only so many venues for a show like this. You know, the Love Sexy Tour, you just can't put it in any old place. <laughs> you need a big arena. And most cities have one. Interesting. So we're competing now with the Michael Jackson Tour and the Madonna Tour, both of which had been booked in advance. And we're all set up. And we had to figure out how to, how to, to, to jerry-rig a routing <laughs> That made sense economically um, because, you you know, you're not trying to move 3,000 miles every time you change cities. You want to do it in a certain sequence. You want to go from L.A. to Sacramento to San Francisco. You know, there's a reason you don't go from L.A. to Chicago to New York. And then back to San Francisco. It's you know, anybody with a map can figure that out. It's a no brainer. But that's what Love Sexy was like in Europe because of the 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 poor availability of venues because of these other tours. And we explained that to him. And he's like, just make it work. I don't care. <laughs> Book stadiums. If you can't get the arenas in a city, find a stadium and we'll play outdoors. You know, and and it was just, just as I said, there's a point where you just say okay, and you make lemonade. You do the best you can. It's what um, as you know, he's the success, and he's much bigger artist now than he was back when you started. There's more people in the camp, and you you mentioned the tension with the management. Does Prince ever um, well I wanted to ask you this how is how is Prince's sort of demeanor in terms of you know as much as you can tell does he come to the rehearsals or is he around is he a, sort of a pleasant guy or is he like dealing with a lot of stuff I was always curious how he seemed to people did he seem happy or sad or, or what 
Man, it's, it, he was like anybody else on any <laughs> given day. I mean, you know, you and I have good days and bad days. We have happy days and hopefully not depressed days, but, you know, days where you physically you don't feel right or, you know, whatever. Or you see something on the news that annoys you or you get a, you have an argument with your girlfriend and your wife that affects your mood that day. He was like, he was like anybody. He had, he okay. had moods. And there were days where he would come in rehearsal carefree and it would be the most fun day of the week. You would just, you know, everything. He didn't mess with anybody. He was friendly. He was patient. And, you know, he might decide, you know, let's don't rehearse. Let's go. Let's let, let's go play softball. <laughs> And he did that a couple of times, particularly in spring, where it'd be like the first warm day. Everybody came to rehearsal, and he had sent out one of his assistants to get a bunch of bats and balls and gloves. And he just all of a sudden said, let's go play softball. And that's what we did. And that means band and crew. And so all of a sudden, you know, in the middle of rehearsals, um, you got, you know, the the whole cast of Purple Rain plus a, a, a band crew out in a lot playing softball. <laughs> um, so, I mean, he was that kind of guy. But then if he came in in a bad mood, then you better fasten your seatbelt because he was going to pick in any little mistake and everything was going to be drama. And, you know, so it was, you know, it was like anybody. So was he like kind of person like it, the day would go based on how he felt? It, he, so I was wondering, like, even if he... Maybe he didn't feel well. I guess you would never know. But he was just, he kept it professional. But you're saying kind of, you it would be one way or the other. Yeah, very much. I mean, he had, he had pretty drastic mood swings. And, and definitely the day was all about whatever his mood was. Interesting. And it was just like, you know, if, if, he, if he was in a certain kind of mood, then everybody else was going to have to adjust and tolerate that. That's just like, okay, it's going to be one of those days. But... But most days it was it was pleasant. I mean, there might be little incidents where he'd get ticked off at something because he he was a perfectionist, and you know shit happens. <laughs> but um, but basically he was he was he was the here's the thing, Prince was the hardest worker. Mm. He was always the first one at a rehearsal and the last one to leave. Mm. And then he'd go to everybody else, go home and eat dinner and watch TV. He would go to the recording studio and be up half the night writing and working on a new joint. The next day you come in and you, you know, sat up last night and did whatever you did and had fun and personal time. And you come into rehearsal the next day and all of a sudden he's got two new songs he just did the night before that you now have to learn. Um, I mean, it, it was like... You couldn't ever disrespect him because his work ethic was so ridiculous mm. that it, it just made everybody else's game move up a level. Because right. if you couldn't keep up, you were you were left behind. Right. You mentioned earlier how, you know, from the revolution period, and it was important for him to get around different musicians who could bring other things to the table. Was this also happening during the Love Sexy period? Were, were you seeing any newer people coming around musically? I'm trying to recall because, I mean, there was there was turnover in the band, but it seems to me that it all happened kind of during Sign of the Times. Um, I'm going to ask you just again. I didn't take my memory pills. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't the Love Sexy band just about the same as the Sign of the Times It, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So so in, in that sense, no, nobody really knew. Um, but this was, you know, this was during the cruise, the, the, the that really crucial period of, of, of intense creativity that we see in the Sign of the Times box set. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just keeping up with that was enough. Because it, it, it was it was just mind boggling how fast he was turning out what we felt was important music. Right, right. Um, after this, the Love Sexy tour is over, the, this, I'm a, I'm an outsider, I'm a fan, but it looks like Prince sort of like is he cleaning house or something at this time in terms of 
Yes. People, you know, what, what, what spawns that? Was, was that again sort of him maybe blaming, saying, hey, this is your fault? This didn't work? Or yeah, I, I mean, you know, how much of it is him saying it's their fault, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens when you have a situation where you spend a whole year damn near on the road um, with a tour that you're unhappy with, with an album that you're unhappy with, and the relationship with the managers has become fractured? Um, I suppose that the way Prince wanted to deal with it was, as you say, clean house. And that's when he actually fired the managers. It was actually on New Year's Eve and announced New Year's Day that um, he intended to, that he was firing not just his managers, Cavallo, Ruffalo, and Farnoli, but also his business manager, his accountants, and his lawyer. So, yeah, it was a total clean house. I mean, to the point where those of us at Paisley Park were like, okay, do we have gigs? Mm. And I mean, I actually went downstairs to the studio and confronted him and say, dude, I, you know, um, and he was like, well, do you want to stay? And I was like, yeah, of course. But, uh, you know, if, if, if you're going to let me go, too, I need to know. <laughs> hmm. And he was like, no, if you want to stay. And, and it wasn't long after that that I said, OK, here's the deal. Um, we're not going to tour for a while. And you're now he had he had appointed Al Magnoli as his new manager. And Magnoli was the film director for. Right. What did you think of that move? I thought it was insane. <laughs> and Prince and I had a confrontation about that. <clears throat> And what I felt was insane about it was that Prince had also hired Magnoli's business managers to be his new business managers, accountants, and lawyers. So I'm like, okay, if you want to hire a new manager, great, but don't hire their lawyers, which is what he did. And he was like, no, you don't understand. And I said, I do understand. It's a mm. conflict of interest. And Excuse me. It's all good as long as you and Magnolia are on the same page. Right. But if you have a problem, if there's a conflict down the line, and he and Princess was this is typical Prince. He's just like I don't think like that. There's no room for conflict down the line. Um, mm. I don't think like that. Which is his just his way of just staying, you know, stay in the now and be positive and don't bring any negative energy in here. Right. I'm like, OK, dude, I'm just saying I'm on record. I warned you this is this is this is not a good situation. It can't have a good outcome. And he's like, well, you're just jealous because you want to be the manager. And I'm like, no, if I wanted to be the manager, I would have applied. I would have been spending the last three months applying for it because I could see you were getting rid of. Bob and Steve. So I would have positioned myself, but I didn't do that. I didn't want that gig. And I really didn't. Um, you, you just said something very interesting. Just to, and I want to go back to, to Albert. You said positioning myself. It, it, was it there? And I'm curious how Prince got back into the point where he's talking to Albert, where he's <laughs> hiring him as a manager. Was there some, do people, you know, is there positioning People trying to get to sit in certain yeah, roles in the, in the game, like, like in anything, absolutely, absolutely. If if you're if you're on the bench, if 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 you play basketball and you're on the bench or you're the sixth man, aren't you going to position yourself to try mm. to become a starter? I mean, you know, it's 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 human nature in in any field. Now, Magnoli had been around in Europe during Love Sexy Tour because they were shooting what was supposed to be a documentary. It was an idea uh, they were into a documentary film. I remember seeing little clips from this. And there's been movie. clips of Prince with George Clinton and Mavis Staples in the studio and different stuff that have come out of that. But Magnoli was around. And who knows more than other than Prince and Magnoli what they were talking about at night when they were supposedly meeting about this documentary film and nobody else was there but the two of them sitting in a hotel room um, and Prince is pissed off with the managers and grumbling because he was mm. grumbling to me all the time. I'm sure he was grumbling to Magnoli. And Magnoli was in a situation to position himself if he wanted to. And apparently he did. 
Um, I'm not saying that's bad. That's ambitious. And he probably really believed he could help Prince. You but, mean like be his sole type manager without the other dudes? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Like this can't be that hard. It just, just means making Prince's ideas happen, you know, but it, it was very naive because he had no experience, no connections, no, no, um, 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 network right. of people to depend on um you know no relationships can i can I, I i gotta ask you something real quick just on what you're saying sure. and the other two gentlemen that we're talking about bob cavallo and uh i can't think of steve ranoli steve and, and bob cavallo Cav they had a third partner who yeah the, the silent kind of dude but were those right. two when you say they had to connect i mean those and, and those i think those are I would imagine they're important in Prince's career that those cats was connected and could go get resources and money. I imagine to make exactly. some of these projects happen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It, without them, then everybody would have been a purple rain movie. I mean, the, the, it was their relationship with the heads of Warner records that convinced Warner records to go to Warner films and get the money to make the movie. Mm -hmm. And we're talking um, about like people who are probably above or in different sections of a Mo Austin or something, but like the, the head of the games to be able to say, go to that. You connected well, with my man, go to this person. He can, you guys going to work with him to get this project going. And they just had the connections in the industry to do these types of moves for Prince. Is that exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and to influence the label to, to prioritize your artists, to have that mm -hmm. kind of influence with the executives at the label, to know people at film companies, basically to have the network necessary to make shit happen. And, um, you know, always have your artists positioned in a favorable place. And um, it, it, it also involves the touring industry, where relationships with promoters all over the world are mm. extremely important in order to get the right dates and the right venues and, and the right kind of support in each market. Um, all, it's all about relationships. And I mean, what business isn't, but right. particularly the music business. And, it, and, and keep in mind, too, that we're talking about the 80s, where the music business, particularly the touring business, hadn't yet become totally corporatized. There wasn't the Live Nations mm. um, back then. That, that would control a tour all over the world. You had to deal with individual promoters. And, and that was, is that the difference too? Because I know you know this in terms of there's that larger industry that you're talking about. And then there was that Chitlin, Chit, you know, Chitlin circuit right. type of thing. And, and here's Prince, a black artist who is now the pop artist, right? And does he understand, like, if when I let go of this management company, part of that relationship is that? that you just talk about you have to have an industry does that go as well or now that he's prince he can have a direct to some of these people i think i think it was more the latter i i, I think it was really a case of prince thinking hey the product is me the reason the promoters and the record companies are interested because it's prince you know stephen farnoli and bob cavallo they don't make music their mm. names ain't on the on the marquee at a venue. They don't. Nobody buys tickets to see them. So I think, like many artists, he really felt that that those kind of relationships you would automatically be able to get as a new manager because you represent. All you had to do was say, "I represent Prince," mm. and to some degree, he's right. I mean, it wasn't like Warner Brothers, right? It wasn't like Mo Austin wasn't going to see Prince's new manager. He had to. The question was, was he going to respect him? Mm. So now that he has Albert and, and you're there as well, the next project, did Batman sort of come onto you guys' lap to Prince or was he doing, he was going to do something else? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. Bob Cavallo, who was now replaced by Albert Magnoli and now no longer had anything to do with Prince. Bob called me and told me that the film company was interested in Prince doing music for Batman. And everybody knew Batman was going to be a huge project. It was one of those movies that everybody was waiting for. 
And he said, look, this is a real opportunity for Prince and he needs it. You know, we, we all realize that, you know, he's kind of ice cold now for the first time in his career. He's 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 stumbling. Love Sexy didn't really work. The Black Album got canceled. We don't know what's going to happen next. And, um, you know, it would really benefit him. He said, so like, you know, I'm not going to call him because, you know, we're going to end up suing him and it's going to be ugly and so mm. on. He said, but why don't you take this project to him? Because it's really the best thing for him. Mm. And um, that's how it happened. So I, I you know, called Prince and I said, look, it, there's an opportunity. I didn't tell him it came from Bob. I just said, there's an opportunity from the film company to get involved. The director wants you involved. Can we set up a meeting? And he was like, holy shit. Yeah, great idea. Let's do it. Hmm. So so it kind of came from the back door and credit the, the managers he just fired. They brought us the project. Wow. Just because, just because Cavallo said this is the right thing for Prince right now. And if I was still managing him, this is what I would suggest he do. That's crazy. I never heard that which, which shows you the kind of guys they were. Right. Interesting. Wow. Okay. And, uh, of course, the Batman thing. Now, what, but was Prince working on something else before that? Or did well, he's he? Al he was always, always writing. He was always creating new music. Okay. But, you know, he was kind of fooling around with different projects. He did Madhouse and a second Madhouse album and different ideas for different things. I mean, he was always working on something or other. It might be Ingrid Chavez or Jill Jones or God knows what. Um, <sighs> always, always creating. But I don't think he really had a vision as to what the next project would be. Now, that was also the time where it was like all part of this negotiation when he's like, do you want to stay or do you want to go? And I said, here's the deal. Just like I didn't want to be the manager, I don't want to be the tour manager anymore. And since you have a label, Paisley Park Records, mm. the people that used to run the label were your old managers. Really, nobody ran the label because it was just kind of like Warner Brothers ran the label because there wasn't there wasn't like an office for Paisley Park Records. If you if you were 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 wanting to try to get an audition to get a deal with Paisley Park, you didn't even know who to call because there was no <laughs> office, no phone number. And I'm like, if you really want to do something with this label, let me run the label. Let me stay here and split my time between here and Warner Brothers and run the label. Let's actually try to make a go of the label. That's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And he was like, okay, cool. I appreciate that. That's great. So that that's how we move forward at that point after the house cleaning. And the, the, the real reason to be perfectly blunt, I don't know if I've ever said this before in an interview, and I love Albert Magnoli. He's a sweet guy. I have nothing against him. Um, and a talented, talented director and, and film editor. But I knew that he didn't have a clue about touring. Mm. The record company thing he could he could figure out, but but the touring end he had zero experience, no relationships, and I knew that the promoters and the people we needed on our side weren't going to respect it because they were, they'd be like, "Who is he? He doesn't know our he doesn't know our game. He's an outsider." Mm -hmm. Well, I knew what was going to happen is I was going to end up teaching him the touring business. Wow. Because it was just inevitable that, that the next time we went on tour, um, I was going to be in charge like usual, but I was going to have to teach him. And I was like, OK, if he's going to be making the big money as the manager, then I, I'm not going to be teaching him how to do that shit. And it wasn't personal. It was just it didn't make sense. It's like if I've got to teach him to do that shit, then you're going to have to cut me in. Um, <laughs> and Prince wasn't about to do that. So it was like, OK, and, you know, F this touring shit, let, let him go for himself. Yes. I'm not about to teach him the business. Um, so let me run this label. We're going to do this over here now. <laughs> now, so this Paisley Park records. <laughs> Uh, salute to Paisley Park Records. I, I'm curious. I, I forget this. I have Alan Lees. He's all in all, he knows all about Paisley Park Records. What was the intention 
in your mind of Paisley Park Records and who decided what came out on (laughs) (laughs) the intention we'd have to ask Prince um, that was something that seemed to change more than once and that was source of big frustration for me Um, because I actually was naive enough to think, okay, let's make a go of this. Warner's got a ton of money. It's a joint venture. They're being real generous with him in backing projects. Let's let's make this work. This can be Mm. cool. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and and end up being and 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 you know something career wise that would be good for me, um, and a, a opportunity to be part of something that could be very exciting, but it became clear at some point that Prince's idea for the label really was confusing. It really depended on you know if if. If he had a girlfriend and made an album mm. and he believed in in that, then that became a priority. It, it, inevitably, it was up to Prince what records we submitted for release. Now, Warners could say no, but they didn't. Mm. So any finished album that we gave them, they released. So really, the answer to your question is who was in charge? Of course, Prince was. So with that said couple of things. Now you got me thinking. The first releases were either, I believe, Sheila E. albums. At least they had the Paisley Park logo on it. They had the logo, but she was signed to Warner. Warner. She okay. was never signed to Paisley Parker. That's what I was wondering. So they handled that album. Correct. They, okay. Um, well, then you had Madhouse. But I want to go to, to Jill Jones. Two, two questions. Mm-hmm. Two questions. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you the second one just for laughs. So I remember when a good question came out, I wasn't really a fan of that, but I could see just from me watching TV and it was coming out. I was like, this must be some success with this, this song they got. But I didn't see the Prince connection into it. So now that I have you here, I'm just curious. How, how did you come across this good question? Group? And that what, was, go ahead. That was actually before I took over the label. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I took over the label in, I want to say, February of, I guess, was it 90? No, it would have been 89. Okay. Because it was after Love Sexy was when he fired the man. Yeah, so it was, it was like January, February of 89. Good question came out earlier. That was something that e- either Farnoli or Cavallo um, brought brought them to the label. They, they, I had nothing, nothing to do with that. No involvement. Didn't know the guys. Um, you know, didn't, nothing to do with it. Um, and there was something else they brought too that I forget that that came out on Paisley that came and went very quickly. Uh, you had you respect to the young man with Tony Lemaine's. If I'm saying his name Tony right. Lemaine's came a little later. I that was later. Okay. Had to do with finishing that album. Okay. So that that was, in fact, that may have been the first project we had when I took the label over. Interesting. Okay. All right. Um, well, I was going to ask you about the Jill Jones, but I believe that was earlier than two. Uh, from that yes, mistake. yeah, the Jill Jones record was finished and out before I took over the label, but we were in discussions with Jill about a second album. Oh, really? That um, I very much wanted to do. She had taken on outside management, but she had real solid management and some good creative ideas and some collaborators that I thought were promising and actually thought we could have made a good second album with Jill. That would have been um, actually more about who she really was as an artist, but uh, but it never happened. Wow! And uh, were there other? What, what was the album that you were most proud of from your time of uh, working at Paisley Park Records? I guess, out of respect to my parents, I'll say my brother's <laughs> second solo album. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Things Left Unsaid, which was Eric's second solo album and was just an absolutely magnificent jazz fusion kind of progressive project. 
um, that downbeat in the jazz magazines gave five stars, the whole bit and really? had, had really had, had, a, a, had people that had played with weather report and Santan. And I mean, the list of side men on the record was very impressive. Um, really, really a terrific record. And the jazz department at Warner's did a lot of work and it, it did well on, in, in the jazz market, which unfortunately at that time was very small. There was no Kamasi Washington yet to bring jazz back to the back to the forefront of things, and um, you know it kind of languished. But on jazz radio, it did very very well. It charted. It was on all the jazz charts and so on. So I, I was really proud of that because just musically, it's a, it's just a, a, a really astounding record. Um, I know that that doesn't really speak to to Prince and so on because he had nothing to do with that one. He he did have something to do with with okay. with Eric's first solo album, um, which I also liked. Um, which but, album had the dopamine? I liked I liked the Tony and Lamont's record. I thought okay. that that was a reasonably uh, that was a professional, competitive kind of LA sounding record for its time. I mean, it 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 kind of fit what was going on. It certainly wasn't a Prince project. It wasn't cutting edge, <clears throat> but it had, it had the little flavor of Lenny Kravitz. Mm. And the unfortunate part of that was Tony who was God rest his soul was killed in an automobile accident right. uh, shortly after the record came out. So that, 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 that obviously ended then. Um, With an album like I that. I liked oh. Ingrid Chavez's record. Okay. Okay. We've had her on here. Just to go back to the Tony record for a second, mm -hmm. um, is again when you finish these albums, do you have to submit them to Prince before you know before you can put it out? Because you said he approves them or something. Or? Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. Would he have like ideas in terms of how uh, any of these uh, artists Sometimes. were marketed? Yeah, definitely, definitely. We would have. I mean, what, what, what? When I took over the label, I instituted regular meetings. Um, you know, I had read what Barry Gordy did when he started Motown, and it was like, okay, we're going to have creative meetings at least once a week, where we talk about every project, the status of it, whoever's producing it. Let's talk to them and get get an update. Talk about what single, what should be singles. Talk about who should do remixes of the singles, because at that time there were different radio formats that wanted certain kind of remixes. And we would talk about what what DJs we should get to do that, because there were certain people, Frankie Knuckles and other people that were, had reputations that helped you get airplay. If, if you know, if you had a remix by so and so, it helped you get airplay. So you look to make deals with those people. Um, and of course the, the visuals, which is something Prince was always interested in because he's, you know, always coming up with inventive ideas for videos and so on. And we would talk about directors for videos. Um, you know, anything that had to do with the project would be discussed at these meetings. Okay. Um, the Batman album. And guys didn't, well, there was a new tour, I suppose, after that. I don't know if you had left at that point yet, but, but I was yeah, curious. I, mean, I what... didn't do that tour. That was the first tour that oh, okay. I did not do since, you know, before 1999. So during this period when the Batman album comes out and, you know, as the movie, the Batman movie was a big success, I know the album was huge. Bad Dance was all over the place, uh, yeah. which I remember that heavy. What was the feeling like? In the camp, because it was, I think you guys got another big sell. You know, this one's this one's blowing up. Was there talk of okay, we're gonna ramp back up again, or what was going on? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it was like okay, th th this is this is. It was a time when you know he was working. What was let's see, what was the next album? Was the Diamonds and Pearls? Uh, no, Graffiti Graf Graffiti Bridge. Oh, God forbid. How could I forget that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, then, then there was that. Uh -oh. um, yeah, we, we kind of got past that in a hurry. And, and, you know, financially, he needed to tour. There was obviously money to be made out there. So thus the nude tour. Um, which really wasn't tied to a record. But what forgive me, what was the album after Graffiti Bridge? 
Uh, Diamonds and Pearls. That was Diamonds and Pearls, yep. which, of course, was huge. Yes. yes. It was huge. And, um, you know, that was that was the comeback album. That was the album. And we had what was what were the singles? Cream. Yeah. Uh, well, Get Off, Cream. Yeah. 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 Money Don't Matter yeah. Tonight. So you're still working with Prince during this period. Yeah, I was still there when that. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And um, and of course, the new tour was very successful, hugely successful, because at that time he hadn't toured for a bit. He'd been off the road for a couple of years, so that was very successful. And you know, everything was 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 going, but it was it was, but it was different because now it was like. Now it was we 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 had lost the feeling of being cutting edge, of mm. being like like you know every every era has somebody who's the shit who's just undeniably the, mm-hmm. the leader of the pack. It was it was like you know in the seventies it was P Funk and Earth Wind. Before that it was Sly. Before that it was James Brown, and it was like you know these were the people that identified an era. And, you know, for the 80s, Prince was that, you know, he was the bomb. It was like whatever Prince did first, everybody followed. And now all of a sudden he's not leading. Nobody's following. He's just he's just being Prince. He's a guy. Now he's like any other artist who who makes a record every year or two. There's always some dope songs on the record. You may not like them all. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. But the whole idea of the concepts and the movies is all kind of behind us. And it's just become kind of regular. Mm. And it had become clear that that the situation with Paisley Park Records was blown up and and was just um, it is, as as Prince became unhappy with Warner's about his own records in his own career. Obviously, the relationship with Paisley Park suffered because if they're feuding then how in the world am I going to run a joint venture successfully? Because it was like, you know, it, 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 it just, the feud kind of just bled over hmm. and got in the way of what we were trying to do with Paisley because Warner's is pissed at Prince, so they're not going to do Paisley any favors. And, um, you know, I was, I was, I was disappointed with the George Clinton situation. And I was part of what brought George to Paisley. He had a he was without a label, and he had sent me some material, um, and basically just asked me as a favor, like, "Hey, one one thing thinking about Paisley was like, hey man, I'm looking for a label. I got some stuff that's already in the can, but hmm. you know, I'm looking for a deal." He had had tax problems. The group P Funk wasn't touring. Um, it was a you know bad time for the P Funk camp. So I gave the tape to Prince. Actually, I was listening to it in my office, and Prince walked in and said, what's that? And I told him what it was, and he said, give me that. And he took the tape and came back and said, let's sign him. (laughs) And I'm like, look, I love George. I've known George since, ironically, since Testify first came out is how long I've known him. Uh And and I love him to death, but – He's high maintenance. <laughs> you know? um, are you really ready for that, Prince? And he's like, that's George Clinton. Are you kidding? Whatever he wants. Well, let's get he deserves it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I agree with that. I totally support that. So, okay, let's do it. Now, Warner Brothers was interested in that idea and helped support us signing George, despite their funkadelic history 10 years before that. Mm-hmm. Um but the whole issue was everybody was expecting Prince to work with George. And the idea was it was going to freshen up George's shit. And to the point where it give George something that was more commercial for the 80s. Because since Atomic Dog, he really hadn't had a hit. He had had some really good records that were kind right. of overlooked. But, um, but the last real hit had been Atomic Dog. So he was looking and looking for a label. And, um, you know, everybody just thought Prince George, that's, that's the shit. Yeah, on paper, that sounds amazingly. Exactly. <laughs> Problem was, they'd never really worked together. Prince wouldn't work with him. He's like, he was like, who am I to tell George Clinton what to do in the studio? Wow. 
You know, he's the master. I have no right to. So it, it was like, and it was the same with the idea of working with Miles Davis mm-hmm. and all these other collaborations. As Prince didn't really want to collaborate. Prince would write a song for you <laughs> and give you a track. And mm-hmm. he gave George several tracks. But it wasn't like they did anything fresh together. Or, or stimulated each other's creative and You know, it wasn't like they sat in a studio and just bonded the way, say, George and Bootsy did back in the day. Right. Um, and if, if they had, God only knows what might have come out of it. But that just wasn't, that wasn't Prince. He wasn't comfortable working that way. He's like, I'll give him tracks. And yeah. um, as a result, you know, we were all less than pleased. I mean, there, there's some good stuff on on the George Clinton albums, but you gotta you gotta search for it. Um, it's yeah, not, it's not what I thought. It's I, I was it's work. not what you thought it was going to be. I think exactly, yeah. exactly. So that was disappointing. Um, mm-hmm. The Mavis Staples albums, I thought, were very good for what they were. They were just ahead of their time. Nobody mm-hmm. was listening to Southern Soul at that point. Right. It was the 80s, and that just wasn't what time it was. To, to most people, it was something that was just old and passe. And, of course, Mavis has had a wonderful comeback mm-hmm. that was super deserved, and now her albums are selling well again, and, and she's found a renaissance because, the, you know, times change, and yep. tastes change, and all of a sudden there's a generation that wants to check out that shit, you know. And here's Mavis, who's the queen of it. So, but, so that was just a case of... of it just wasn't the right time. Um, uh, and so I, I, I got to, I'm going to jump ahead, but just to, to, to put the button on Prince here a little bit, what was the, what caused you to, to leave, uh, to move on to other things? It was just time. He was so frustrated with Warner's and I didn't agree with his frustrations, quite honestly. Um, I mean, yeah, there were certain things that we were both frustrated about as a company because I was loyal to him. But once again, his solutions and his ideas, in some sense, they were a little bit ahead of his time because he really believed that the problem was that Warners couldn't release product as quickly as he wanted it out. You know, he was, Mm. you know, creating so quickly and he would want them to put an album out and they'd be like, no, 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 it's not time yet. You got to wait, you got to wait, you got to wait too soon. And um, he wasn't about that. He was just about, I want to put music out any old time I feel like it. (laughs) And I don't care about the market. The Mm. music will make its own market. So his thing was like, hey, man, let's just do telemarketing. You know, we'll we'll have our own label and go on TV and do commercials at night and sell them that way. Um, Wow. (laughs) And and it was like, you know, dude, we can't do that. We have contracts. (laughs) You know, that that's that's not legally (laughs) an option. Um, So we would have those kind of conversations. and 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 it was really getting to the point where it was obvious he had lost interest in Paisley Park Records because he had lost interest in Warner Brothers. So I'm sitting there running a label that basically has no support anymore. It was just pointless mm. and totally frustrating because I thought if, if we had approached it right, you know, I actually thought we had a shot to do a little something. But, um, you know, it wasn't going to happen because he wasn't going to work with the artists. And the idea of just signing girlfriends got old real quick. It was just like, you know, when it came, when it was, you know, Carmen Electra. And and he actually came in the office once because I was working on Ingrid Chavez, which actually had a buzz in Europe. So we set up a, a promo tour for her in Europe that, that I actually went with her. And we met with all the, you know, we did the whole, the whole promo thing with hmm. you know tv shows and radio and with the label reps in every european country and it was very well received and and the album actually made a little noise over there just as the jill jones record had a couple of years before so um I, you know i was working on ingrid and trying to find the market for it because it was admittedly an odd record but 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 it was a sexy record that really there was kind of a place for it hmm. um not not easy to find that place, but we were working on it. And again, it was a record I was handed. I didn't produce that, but you know, he 
he'd signed a girlfriend and told her to make a record. And this is what I had to work with. Um, but at the same time, he's spending gazillions of dollars making videos for these tracks he had done with Carmen Electra. Mm. And one day he came in the office and he looked at me and he says, I'll sell more Carmen Electra records than you will Ingrid Chavez. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Ingrid was your girlfriend. Your <laughs> girl, okay, let's let's don't get this twisted. Oh, um, you know, and I, and at that point, I knew my days were numbered. It was just like, okay, now it's gotten to that point, and where it, it's it's just a game of of putting one girlfriend against the other. And I'm like, mm. I don't even want to be part of this. This is just silly. And and what did and, you think of the Carmen Electra album? <laughs> Like, I mean, yeah, I like it, it. it was a rapper, which is interesting. You probably put stupid. that out now. She probably might blow with social media and everything, but. It was stupid. Wow. It was stupid. It, it was a guy trying to do something that he didn't understand. Mm. He's taken her, who was an ambitious, you know, I'm going to be polite, a very ambitious young lady who was looking for whatever avenue she could find to get a career. Mm. And Prince with a ton of, of, of B-side type material and an infatuation with Carmen and her charisma, mm. put it politely. <laughs> um, <All right. laughs> and whatever it was she offering. <laughs> And okay, <laughs> and um, and then incorporating elements of hip hop, and I'm like, you know, again, it wasn't a culture he understood. I mean, it was like back to the the idea of Tony M in the band, Diamonds and Pearls, a huge record. He goes on tour, and he's got he's got an MC in the band who. <laughs> was a background dancer and just one day at rehearsal said, I can, I can spit a little bit. And Prince was like, wow. okay, you're, a, you're my rapper then, you know? Wow. And it, it was just, it was almost like if I'd have gone in rehearsal and told <laughs> them I could spit, <laughs> I'd, I'd have become the rapper, you know? And, and that's, that's kind of how he looked at it. Like it's a gimmick. Man. He didn't get the culture. Right. And that's why I say the record was stupid because it was made for all the wrong reasons. It was trying to be something he wasn't. And I mean, when he got to the point where later on he was touring and singing into a microphone shaped like a gun, I'm like, mm -hmm. homie, that ain't you. Go, go, <laughs> go, go, go back home and remember who you are. Go mm -hmm. see your daddy. Something. Because it's like, that's not what you do. You've got this genius gift. And you, 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 you're trying to get in the sandbox and play kids' games. You're trying to do something that the next generation does that's a culture mm. that you don't relate to. And mm. it's okay you don't relate to it. Your blackness doesn't depend on you passing yourself off as a thug. Mm. That ain't what blackness is. Blackness is a lot of different things. And in this case, it's a little guy from Minneapolis. Hmm. And it's still blackness. It's okay. Just fucking be you. And it was kind of like I saw that coming and it was like it was uncomfortable. I, I just, the whole environment, and just between the war with Warner Brothers, and I had no idea how that was going to end up. And of course, ends up after I'm gone, he's wearing slave on his face and shit. And I'm like, you're the only slave who owns the plantation. You look at Paisley Park. <laughs> you know, like, come on, man. It, it, none of it made sense to me. I, I understood his frustrations, but I didn't understand the emotions that he chose to fight the frustrations with. It wasn't, it didn't make sense to me. And it was clear he was trying to find himself. And it was at a time, it, it was at a time where he was, you, you asked earlier if he would listen to people. By this time, he had cut people off. He wasn't listening mm. to anybody except his own demons. Mm. And it was like, it just wasn't pleasant to be around because it wasn't the same guy. It was a guy who was really, really unhappy 
that he wasn't at, at the cutting edge of things anymore and trying to figure out how to handle that. And it, it, it was just unpleasant to be around. So we just kind of agreed to disagree in part of ways. Wow, I mean, it, it was a pleasant party. It wasn't, it wasn't like an, an angry, you know, confrontation because he knew my feelings and it was obviously Paisley Park Records wasn't going anywhere. And I don't want to go back to being his tour manager. Um, it was, you know, it was just, it was 10 great years. Yeah. yeah. And it was time. During, and you know, you talked about, you know, the sort of transitioning in music and culture, particularly hip hop, coming from just being, you know, what they think is some flashing thing as it starts to encompass and just devour <laughs> everything musically. Uh, I want to ask you, because you, you know about music, specifically black music. I want to ask you about R&B at this time and the resurgence and out of, and, and I'm transitioning, but in the wings comes these new cats. One in particular, uh, D'Angelo, you know, he drops his first album, which at the time, in my opinion, was like a silent bomb. Uh, real quick. I remember I got to see that first tour he did and I had heard the album but I wasn't all into him, but I was something said, so let me go check out this cat. And I was taken aback that he was just sitting down, but listening to it. And I was like, this motherfucker right here, I, like he got to be on some prints. Like I just, there's no way that he doesn't listen to Prince or something and all this other stuff. And I'm like, he's going to be the shit when he stands up, <laughs> you know, but I'm like, you can hear him. It's all there. There's, there's so much soul in this, which you don't, you haven't heard this in a long time. But I was like, when this nigga get off his feet, if he ever do, and if I, I, you know what I would say back then, I was like, man, if he was on his prince, or like if he was on like some parade or some sign of times, that energy mixed mm -hmm. with the music is oh, he he'd be the game, he'd be that next black, pop, you know, R and B pop dude. So with that said, I'm curious, what did you think of black music at this period in terms of R and B and its relationship to the culture? And then here comes D'Angelo. Is he this? Is he like the well, savior coming or something? Yeah, for me, um, I th I think I had gotten simply because of my age, I'd gotten kind of blase by then, and it was like, okay, just about everything that comes out sounds like something I've heard before. So I wasn't really into a whole lot of R and B at that point, particularly in the nineties. Um, you know, I was into certain things. I wasn't into a lot of hip hop either. I mean, mm -hmm. thankfully, my son convinced me hip hop was um, a serious genre to be taken seriously. And, you know, pretty soon I was into Public Enemy and Tribe and okay. things like that. Okay. But, yeah. um, um, <laughs> Well, I was, I'll tell you what happened. Actually, my, my entree to D'Angelo came through Maxwell. I mean, and okay. I. Maxwell's first album, Fire, um, <laughs> I thought was a classic. Mm -hmm. Somebody gave me an advanced copy, and by then I'm freelance tour managing. I had just come off a Sheila E tour, a very wide tour, this one, that one. And a friend at Columbia Records sent me a, an advanced copy of the Maxwell album, um, Urban Hang Sweet, his first album. Just because they thought it was something I'd like, and they were right. I was like, <laughs> "Holy shit! This this is now this is because I was into Sade, and, right, right, you know, so on and so on." And I liked Stuart Matthew Man, and, and and I fell in love with the Maxwell album. I said, "Oh, this this guy's got the goods." And lo and behold, um, his agent happened to call me and said, "Hey, I need a tour manager for a young artist who's who's really green, but he's difficult, but you know." Sounds like a recipe you can handle. So it was like, okay, what the fuck? Who's his name? Maxwell. And I'm like, no shit. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so I did the first, I want to say, four or five Maxwell tours to the point where really? you built him up to the point where he was a theater headliner. Now, Brown Sugar dropped around the same time as Urban Hang Sweet. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
you know, there was actually the press made a lot of con, made a lot of, of trying to. They would review the two records together as if they were somehow the same because there was this whole focus on neo soul, right? And and so on. And you know, I was into I was into Badu, I was into the Roots, I was into um, obviously uh, Lauren Hill's record, mm. and. Um, can't think what else, but you know, and, and Michelle and Gacelle, a huge fan of hers. Right, right. Um, so, so that 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 part of the R and B world, I was I was very much into, and um, then here comes Brown Sugar, and I'm like, holy shit, this is this is another one, you know, mm-hmm. this is this is an amazing record with great songs, smart covers, well produced. The guy apparently is a real musician, so on and so on. So I was anxious to see him. And like you, I was, I was in Houston with another act. I can't even remember what. But but somehow he was on the show, was, was in, in the, not even the headliner. Um, and I went out and watched him. And again, little chubby guy with a trench coat sitting at a piano. <laughs> and, you know. Visually, it was boring as shit. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, man, this is like, this guy's got all this. And he sounded like Donny Hathaway reincar- reincarnated. <laughs> but even Donny would get up and move a little bit. You know, it's just like, <laughs> come on. So I, I kind of kind of like, okay, the kid needs work if, if he's going to be a, a touring artist. But, you know, the record was great. And then at the end of the Maxwell tour, I get a call from his management. Are you interested in meeting with D'Angelo? He's got a new record coming out that he's still finishing. He wants to put a band together and tour properly. And I'm like, yeah, I'll take a meeting. And, you know, that's cool. And took a meeting. But I'm still thinking he's this guy who sits at a piano. And I'm like, okay, how are we going to make this work? Hmm. Um so at the meeting, I start talking about, you know, they asked me if I had any ideas. And I said, well, I said, you know, we've got to center the piano and we've got to build a set around him so that there's something going on visually and so on and so on. And they're like, no, 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 wait a minute. He's going to be sitting in the piano. <laughs> and I'm like, word? Um, okay. <laughs> So anyway, about two weeks later, it's like he had half a band pulled together. We're still trying to figure out who the rest of the people are. He's doing auditions. And I go to a rehearsal. Mm. And what I saw was like the second coming. It was like he's dancing. He's moving around. His shit is sexy. He's the bomb vocally. He's a band leader. He can play guitar. He can show the drummer what he wants. I'm like... This guy's the really, really, really the real deal. He's got it all. And and I was blown away because I didn't think he was a dancer performer. Mm. And you know, chubby little kid sitting at the piano. You said it, you were right. Um D'Angelo's easily the most talented person on the scene since Prince. Mm. Um it's just unfortunate for all of us who love his music that he's got these demons and this this stubbornness about how he releases records and um, so on and so on that that we don't have the body of work that we should have from somebody that talented and you know mm. he's just got his demons that. Um, Yes, and, and and I know it's easy to assume substance abuse, and there have been times where that's very much been part of his problem. But I have to say, and I and I no longer represent T. Um, I'm I'm retired, um, so I no longer have a horse in this race. But I have to say that in the last, at least last four or five years, he's been pretty much sober, and certainly the last few years, he's been straight. So it isn't that. It's it's just. He just is not is, – is, it doesn't come easy for him to get on the stage and do what mm-hmm. he does. Mm-hmm. I saw it the was, movie that he had, the documentary. I, I, I thought oh, you that did? Was, I did. It was very interesting. I, I won't spoil anything, but just the way it ended, though, I was like – when I realized what they were showing me on the screen, uh-huh. it just really hit me. I, I felt sad for him. I felt – I understood him. But I was just like, man, I hope, I hope he's still not in that. 
Like he's got to come out of that at some point in prison. I don't know. I, I spent the better part of 20 years trying to figure out how to get him to open up. And, mm. you know, one on one, he did. I mean, he was he was the most real artist I've ever worked for. Wow. I mean, he was it's 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 like he was your best friend and you, you there was nothing you couldn't talk to him about. You could argue, you could fight, you could holler and scream. You wouldn't fall out. Um, you know, it, it, it was it was you never felt like you couldn't say what you wanted to say. And mm -hmm. you could talk about the most intimate things without reservation. It was absolutely the most honest honest, complete relationship that I ever had with any artist. And I adore Michael Archer to his soul. He is a pure soul. He's a troubled soul, but he's a pure soul and easily the most talented artist since Prince. And, and um, I don't know if the public will ever really get an opportunity to appreciate how deep his talent is, because it goes beyond just the shows. I mean, you talk about seeing him when he toured behind Brown Sugar. But did you see the voodoo tour? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I see. And I watch videos. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a monster. I mean, it's, that shit was like, to me, the mothership tour of the nineties. <laughs> it was generation. like, you know, just, just. I mean, the quality of the band and the vocalists and right. the fact that that D is so generous with his people. I mean, everybody gets featured, and um, it's, it's 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 in the collaborative part of the music and just just. Everything about it. The, the, yeah, it's the, a whole, a whole, there's a whole, I think that thing encompasses a generation because not only is it like giving you the generational part of, you know, uh, soul music, funk, you, you, there's a little bit of James in that, sure. Parliament, there's a lot of Prince, but on the other hand too, there's hip hop in that, there's Jay yep. Dilla in that, there's exactly. Tribe in that, so it just encompassed the whole, the beginning and where we're kind of going. Yeah. And, yeah, it was a moment. Yeah. Man. And and, and, and it, it, it taught me. It was like I always say that 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 that, that I, I can thank D for carrying me through Dilla 101 <laughs> because I didn't get it at first, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean and I I knew who Dilla was, but I didn't get the influence on on people like D and, and Amir and, and of course Common and others. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, a whole generation was influenced by Dilla. Let's don't front. Yeah, but I, I I I didn't get how it affected the live band and what the mentality mm -hmm. was toward incorporating Dilla into how the band played the music live. Mm -hmm. And what fascinated me about D is that you could listen to his records, but when he performed, it really didn't sound at all like the records. Mm -hmm. it, it really brought the songs to life in a way that, that, that where Prince was always like, okay, let's make it sound as much like the record as possible. And whatever it took to do that, um, with D, it was kind of like, let's take the record and let it grow. Let's pour water on it and let it grow. See, that's that's how we felt about the Prince. <laughs> we actually felt the live versions blew the the studio stuff out of the water. And that's why I said, I think D'Angelo did the exact same thing. Was like, yeah, okay. So maybe yeah. my analogy is wrong, but the point's made. It's, yeah, it's, oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, he was a, mon a couple things on D'Angelo, and I'm a huge D'Angelo fan. Like, I'm uh, uh, it's just musically to me, dude is He's the shit, man. I, I I hope he has a troth of other stuff that we get to hear one day. But what I was going to ask you was when you came into that rehearsal and you got to meet D'Angelo, did he know who you were? Because I know he's a Prince fan. Did, were they like, yeah. sit down and just tell us stories? Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> okay. definitely, definitely. Um, as a matter of fact, tell you a funny story. I, the, the, the way it came down is... Um, a Maxwell tour that I had done had just finished. And I was in New York at the end of the tour. We had a meeting with the business managers and the accountants and myself to go over all the 
um, end of tour costs and, you know, just basically put a wrap on the tour on the business end. So we were in the, in the lawyer's office, the accountant's office all afternoon going through receipts and God knows what. And I'm turning over piles of paperwork I'd accumulated over the course of the tour on the road. And it was just basically a typical wrap meeting like you'd have after any tour. So we finished the meeting. I go back to my hotel in New York and my cell phone rings and the, the voice says, is, is this Mr. Lee's? I said, yes. He said, well, my name is D'Angelo and I would love to, you know, I've got a new record coming. I don't know if you're familiar with me or remember that we met once, which we had. And, you know, he's very humble and, and, and so on. And, I thought it was Maxwell playing a gag because (laughs) Max would do shit like that. He would call you up and pretend to be this, pretend to be that. And I had just left him at this meeting like 10 minutes earlier. And we had said goodbye because it was the end of the tour. I wasn't going to see him for a while. So I figure it's him playing. I'm like, oh, Max, fuck you. Shut up and hung up the phone. So then it rings again. I realize the number isn't Max's number. And it, again, it's this, it's, well, Mr. Leeds, I know that seriously, it's is D'Angelo. And I'm like, what the fuck? Okay. <laughs> and he's like, um, are you available to take a meeting with me and my manager? And I'm like, yeah, I, I actually had a flight home to Minneapolis that night. But I said, look, I got to change some flights around, but I can stay over a day and take a meeting, of course. And that's what I did. Um hmm. But, but he was um, – it was obvious from the beginning that he was somebody that, that was a regular guy that was uncomfortable with being a star, uncomfortable mm. with the responsibility and the whole mindset of becoming a boss and a star. Um, Interesting. Is that yeah. – and, and I always wonder because I, I look at uh, D'Angelo – um, I almost kind of look like Andre 3000 in this, in this sense as well. It's like, I feel like those guys could have been the, you know, the guy, you know what I mean? Like that. But I was, you know, I wonder is because they're just uncomfortable being in that star position and everything that comes with that. Yeah. I I can't speak for Andre, but I think you're right. Um, And with D, it's certainly the case. Now, he might not admit that. Because that's part of keeping up the front necessary sure. so that when he does go there, you know, it's, it's part of what pumps him up to be able to do that. Okay. Um, and, and don't misunderstand me. I mean, as a, as, as a band leader and once we're on the road, the idea of being the boss, he's not afraid to make decisions. And, and you know, he rises to the occasion. It's just a question of how much does it take out of him because he's mm-hmm. so uncomfortable doing it. And is it and that's something I you know I, I seem like Prince relished in being yes. the center of attention, <laughs> and yeah. you know you can look at him and feel like yo that dude wants to be yeah. seen has no problem with it. Exactly. And and, and I always like I, I forget that part about him sometimes. Not only was he such a musician and performer, but he also knew like he understood what it was going to take to be a rock star. You know, to really be that guy year after year he was doing it. Yeah, I mean, despite his musical gift, his goal was to be a rock star. I mean, he used to tell Andre Simone, and I'm sure he would have told us if we'd have been there back in the day and asked him. I mean, it was very clear that his goal was to be a rock star. Mm. And he figured out how to pull it off. (laughs) Now, the the interesting thing is that sometimes the people who want to be rock stars aren't necessarily the most gifted musicians. True. That's true. That's true. And, you know, in the case of Prince, you had both to the mm. point where sometimes the rock star got in the way of the music. Mm. <laughs> now, with D, it was like he was so dedicated to the music that he didn't even think in terms of rock star. I mean, he, don't misunderstand me. He appreciated the attention. I mean, when there's, you know, 5,000 people in a theater screaming at you, at you and your performance, you appreciate that. That's real. His appreciation is real, mm-hmm. but he still sees it as a dynamic of the music, not of being a star. Mm-hmm. Because he's, he knows that it, it, at the end of the day, it's the music that's causing that reaction. 
I mean, if, if he came out there and read nursery rhymes, you're not going to get those screams. And that's curious. So, I mean, the whole take your shirt off thing and him sort of being the sex symbol, that really like play into him? Was he having yeah, well, issues that, with that? that was, that's really, that. that's probably the worst thing that ever happened to him because, I mean, it was the best thing in the sense that it blew the, the video, blew up the record. But, um, you know, what it did to him, his mindset was was terrible because once the tour started and, and it was like it was a Chippendale show. I mean, all the chicks up front were screaming, take it off, take it off, take it off. And he's like, please, can you just listen to the music? You know, yeah. um, and then at some point, you know, he's a man. At some point, it was just like, well, OK, if that's what time it is, fuck it all. <laughs> <laughs> At least that won't be lonely at night. Hilarious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you say he lived up to that <laughs> to that yeah. image. Yeah. So it, it, I'm it, not mad know, at him. It became that, but 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 at the end of the day, it wasn't who he wanted to be, and he wasn't he wasn't comfortable with that, and and it was just like, you know, how long was it before we could get him back on the road? Ten years. You know, it was yeah. crazy. When you would you work with him on his last outings that he had? As well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Jesse Johnson. Oh, sure. He's in the band and stuff. Yeah. Oh, Definitely. Uh, I'll speak out of that. A couple, a couple of the tours that we did were really, really exceptional um, behind the Black Messiah project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Black Messiah. I mean, have, have you heard any? I mean, it sounds like he must still have a ton of music and stuff. Is it just that he's just. He cannot finish oh, a song. Is he tinkering? I've heard so many tracks um, that have potential. I mean, he's he's and and I don't know what he's done in the last year. Um, I know he's been in the studio, so he's he's been recording what I presume is new material, and he's got tons of other stuff that's left over that he always insists he's going to finish one day. Problem with these, he doesn't finish things. Mm. He's got to, where his prince is, prince always finished something. That's why his vault is so valuable because there's so many tracks in there mm. that are basically finished. I mean, there's a few that were unfinished, but but you know he would go in the studio with a song idea, and Prince had this obsession that he had to finish something. He was in a hurry to finish it. He had an urgency to finish things because he wanted to get it out of the way and make room for the next song. Because hmm. he was always, that machine was always running. But with D, it was like, he'd have these ideas and then he'd be like, well, there's a new idea I want to work on. So let's set this aside. Then it would be set this aside. So th there's tons of unfinished material. I got it. Okay. Was there ever a time that you knew of that uh, I heard a story about D'Angelo going to Paisley Park, I think in Questlove or something. Do mm -hmm. you, you remember what happened at that? Because it seemed like there was a, 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 a Prince put out a record and I forget the title of it right now. But it was like a remix of one of the records or something. And it sounded like he was talking about D'Angelo and Quest in that record. Does any of this ring a bell to you? No, I'm not familiar with that. I'd like uh, to hear that track. I don't know what track you're referring to. Uh, um, well, I, I'll I'll figure that out. But did, did yeah, but, do you but, know anything about those two? Were you ever meeting or working well, together? I, I knew I knew they went out there. We were on tour. This was during the Voodoo tour, and we came to Minneapolis and had a night off. And Prince invited them out to Paisley, so they went. And initially, I was going to go with him, and then I decided not to because I just I knew it would be awkward. And um, you know, Prince had already made a couple of comments to a mutual friend about the fact that I was in the D'Angelo camp, and uh, he wasn't. You know, he the the problem was a lot of people thought D was a druggie that 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 he was a drug addict, mm. and at that time he certainly was not. Um, I mean, you know, he had, I mean, brown sugar explained a lot, <laughs> right, right. But, but, you know, when you talk about hard drugs, what nothing happened, he was, he was, you know, he had his weed and that was it. Um, but I, I just, you know, I, I didn't want to go out there. So at any rate, they went out and Prince kind of messed with them in the sense that he, he, he put. He said, do you want to talk for a while? And then he said, do you want to jam? Um, and then he said to D something about, um, so Alan's your manager? 
And he said, yeah. And he says, well, watch your tapes. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of my tapes have been bootlegged. I never figured out who did it. Mm. You know, just implying the thought that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, he forgot that I was the guy who actually got. We actually had the feds raiding bookstores and record stores in New York that were selling bootlegs at one point. Wow. I was the guy behind that happening. So, real, real quick, I, I, we got to dispel this because there's so much talk about bootlegs. Real quick, people tend to think like Prince gave those tapes or tapes of his music out so that it could be bootleg. That that's not true, is that? If it is, I don't know it. Okay. But if I found out, it wouldn't surprise me. Interesting. But you guys are very much against people selling his music back, you know, bootlegging and stuff. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I was certainly against any of the unreleased studio material. That was the property of the record company. Nobody could release that, nor should they. Um, as far as the concert tapes... Prince would get pissed about that. I didn't really care. I mean, I, I pursued it because it was part of my job to pursue it. Mm, okay. But as, as far as the fact that there were people going to concerts and making recordings, it, it here's the thing. Anybody who bought a bootleg already bought the real albums. Right. There anybody out here just buying bootlegs. If you're a Prince fan that wants to buy a bootleg and figure out where to go get them, then you already have all the Prince albums. So it's not like we're losing sales. Mm. Got you. I got you. And yeah. as far as a live concert goes, I kind of figured that like once you play the gig live, then it kind of kind of belongs to the fans. <laughs> okay. Well, see, I, going down this route, we're going to go back to D'Angelo. But were you guys, were you aware that some of the after shows had become these bootlegs and stuff like that? Sure. Okay. Couldn't help but be. You'd go to a record store in Europe and there they'd be. <laughs> go to a record store in the village in New York and there they'd be. <laughs> right go on. to flea markets, there they'd be. Wow. And I was trying to keep up with where I'd see him, make notes, and then turn it over to the to the to the feds. Damn. Okay. Uh, so you were saying D'Angelo? He was talking to D'Angelo. He, he insinuated he better watch his tapes. Yeah. With yeah. <laughs> which, which was a you know snarky remark, and it was just it was just being you know just that was just that's Prince being Prince. <laughs> um, and. Um, and then I guess he said, do, do you want to jam? And he, and, 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 um, he had, of course, the most elaborate, latest computer keyboards because <laughs> he was a fanatic about that stuff. And D, of course, is a purist. So he wanted to, he was like, well, do you have, do you have just a plain old Fender Rhodes electric piano? And um, Prince started laughing and it was like he was asking for a, 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 a dial phone or something, you know, something really <laughs> you want to, I want, you guys want to watch TV? And D says, yeah, do you have a little black and white portable? <laughs> you know, right. that, that's kind of like what this was to Prince. But, you know, this is D. He plays, he plays old fashioned acoustic, you know, straight up instruments. Right. And, you know, records the analog tape and really old school determinedly old school. So Prince started making fun of him about that. <laughs> and D took it kind of personally, but he didn't wow. say anything because it's Prince, you know. <laughs> and then he, put, then he put a mirror on the drums and they were playing some jam and, and I suppose it was some old Sly Stone song or God knows what. And I think Larry Graham was there. And, you know, the usual suspects, just just jamming. And then there was something a mirror played and, and Prince came over and got him off the drums. Let me show you how to do this one. You know, <laughs> just, just that, that condes Prince could really be condescending. <laughs> And that's what it was that particular night. And um, interesting. they were in the car coming back from Paisley to their hotel. It was about three in the morning. And Amir, because I told him, I said, okay, call me when it's, I don't care what time it is. You got to call me and tell me how this goes. <laughs> and um, so Amir calls me on the phone. And he's just, he calls me, but he doesn't say anything at first. So finally I said, so what, what, come on, what happened, what happened? And Amir, just is what he said. He said, all I know is 
we both feel like we need to go take a shower. Wow. <laughs> and that was it. That was all they had to say about it. Till the next day, they gave me the detailed story. But, <laughs> um, but that, that was the thing. It was like, you know, we've been set up. We were to, he, he played us, you know. Now, Prince had seen them in, in later years. He saw him when 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 D uh, had the car accident and had some drug issues after the car accident, and um, uh, was was kind of you know in in hibernation. Prince reached out to him and and asked him to come on the road with him. And really, say, and you don't have to get on stage or do anything. And, and you don't just just come out, just come out and hang with me. Interesting. D didn't do it, but the offer was there. It was like, I'll pay for you to just come out, wow. go on tour with me, you know, and just hang with me. Oh, and it was kind of like, you know, let me let me look after you. Let me try right. to build your confidence back up and shit. Um, and, and, of course, he and Questlove became, you know, friendly enough that Amir would get invited to all his parties and stuff. So so it wasn't like that was a falling. It was just, and I told them later, I said, that, y'all, y'all were being tested. That's how, he, that's how he did. He wanted to see what you're made of. Man, I did not know that. Wow, that would have been. I guess it would have been, but it was what it was. But that's amazing to hear that, that Prince offered that. That would have been interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know that he's ever said that to anybody. Maybe I shouldn't have said it, but but um, but that, that's you know that's the kind of guy Prince became. So mm. now he could still you know, like I said, don't play the dozens with him because you're not gonna win. <laughs> um, man, what? Uh, I don't know how to how to get into this. You know, obviously uh, we lost Prince. Uh, you being somebody who worked with them ten years plus, you knew him as a person first of all. Sure, you, you worked for him. Uh, what is the? I'm not gonna ask you what it means. I know we can understand what it would mean to to you for this, but what? Uh, I guess. How does it feel? I, I'm almost like I'm disappointed that he, I mean, you know what I mean? It's hard for me to ask this question because I respect you so much. But what does the loss of Prince mean to us now? Like, you know what I mean? Like, just as his art, who he is I mean, now. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 I think I get where you're going. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a huge loss. It's, 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 it's a huge loss because he was so young. To leave us, it was a huge loss because God only knows what music he would have continued to produce. Um, But having said that, speaking only for myself, I've kind of made peace with it. I hate the cliche, oh, it was just his time, you know. Mm -hmm. But people say when somebody passes, it was their time. And I, I used to always hate that. In fact, when 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 he died, I, I I actually put a Facebook post up about that, arguing about, oh, it's his time. No, it wasn't. Damn it! I was angry he had left. But since then, I've come to I've come to. And I mean, if if you just ask me right straight up, I would say it was his time. Um, I think he had done everything he came here to do. And when you look at the body of work that he left behind, so much of which we haven't even heard yet. Um, and you look at, the, at what he was doing, he had continued to be a, a, a fantastic performer, right. but someone who was frustrated because he had, you know, had major problems with his legs. He couldn't dance anymore, really. He was having trouble with his coordination, I understand, of, of, of his fingers to the point where there was some question as to how long he would be able to effectively play guitar and piano. Mm. Now, I, I, I wasn't that close to him in his, his later years, but, but I've, I've read and been told by people close to him that that was beginning to be a problem. And he was deathly afraid of what was going to happen in the years to come with his physical abilities. Um, I think he was just done. I, th- I think he had, he had, he had done everything he came here to do. 
Man. Now, it took me several years to reach that that right. vantage point because initially I was angry. It's like, how dare you leave us? We're not ready for you to leave us yet. I was almost offended. I, I can hear it. I can hear. Do you think like, I mean, you're offended because, you know, he, he was the still the same prince that you knew deep down. Maybe he was a little wiser, but he was. Well, and, I, and I say that like, do you think he was, does he have the not answer to anybody, but, you know, can somebody question him on anything? No, I'm sure he was wiser, but I think he was, you know, from everything I've heard and seen, he was obviously just as stubborn. I mean, when they landed that plane in Illinois in the week before he passed, right. he was angry they did it. I mean, he had passed out and they're trying to save his life and he cussed him out for doing it. Um, and he was obviously very stubborn about getting help for his problems and who he would see and how he would see them. And, I mean, this was a guy who, you know, he built Paisley Park. I mean, it, everything about him was trying to be secretive. And he was he was still in that that very secretive mindset. Mm -hmm. And um particularly with the meds that he was having to take. I mean, he didn't want that public. So, you know, he was, he was, um, he was a lonely guy at the end. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was sad in a way because I mean, he'd had two failed marriages and of course the tragedy with his son. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, his career had leveled off, but I mean, he was, he was, you know, never going to be, you know, he was too old to be the, 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 the cultural leader anymore. And, um, basically he was just getting huge amounts of money to get up there and do the same thing night after night, just jam on, on his music. And he had tons of music to jam on and he loved it. But the idea that, 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 he was, you know, going to have to play Purple Rain every night for the rest of his life. I, 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 I'm just guessing because I didn't sure. know him at the end, but, but it just seems to me that would have frustrated him. Yeah. And the fact that there was really no audience that was eagerly listening to his new material. I mean, nobody was killing themselves to get to, 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 to download the latest Prince record. I mean, yeah, there was a there's a cult. There was, of course, we're, we're, there's Prince fans. That's we, yeah, <laughs> our, our fan. But I hear what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Yeah, but, but it was hardly newsworthy. You know, he dropped a record, and nobody even uh, outside of the cult, nobody even knew it. When was the last Prince album or project that you followed? Or are you aware of? That I was aware of. Well, the ones that you could, I, I know that record. I have that one. Like after you left. Well, I have them all. Most of oh, okay. them, you know. Um, I would say that, strangely enough, Rainbow. That's a dope um, record. <laughs> there were things about it that annoyed the hell out of me, particularly those little the, narrations. The voices. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> because I thought they got in the way of some of what was his most interesting songs at the time. Mm. There's some dope shit on that album. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think that's the last record of his that I would have said that about him. Okay. How did you think he was as a performer, though? Like his live performing skills? From everything I've seen in clips, YouTube, and so on, because it, it had been quite a while since I had seen him perform personally, probably not since the late 90s. Oh, okay. Um, as good as ever. I mean, he he ruled the stage. He knew what to do out there. Yeah. Yes. And the music, you know, he had he had ex extraordinarily talented musicians. Um, in most cases, and you know, great bands. Um. Would Would you have ever thought that he would have had Maceo in his band back when you were working with him? No, <laughs> no, no reason to think that, but, but it made sense. 
It yeah. makes sense. I know, I know Eric got a kick out of that. <laughs> as, as he told him, he said, well, this is the best thing you could do. I was, he was my mentor. He, and Macy actually had been Eric's mentor. I mean, Eric knew all the James Brown guys as a kid because he would follow me around. And uh, all those guys, Fred Wesley and Pee Wee Ellis and Mace, they all knew Eric as like a 15-year-old, 14-year-old wannabe musician. <laughs> so, you know, once he blossomed, they were like, yeah, go ahead, kid, you know. Um, so the idea of Maceo re essentially replacing Eric was really kind of funny because Eric was like, yeah, Prince, it's like, if you're going to replace me, you might as well take the guy who taught me. You know? Right. Go get the master. <laughs> exactly. Wow. There was, there was one tour in Japan. I can't tell you exactly when, but it was, it was in the 2000s, I think. And um, there was one point because, because Prince was, was using a Candy Dulfer. Mm -hmm. and Maceo but there was a point where Candy couldn't make it she had uh, their obligations so he brought Eric back into the band just for this tour and they played some dates in Canada and a handful of dates in Japan where the horn section was Maceo and Eric and Greg Boyer wow and I've got some, some recordings that, that Eric had from those gigs and it was a time when Prince was doing really loose shows and letting the horns just do stuff on their own. And, and I mean, it's just classic stuff. I mean, and, and Eric and Mace are like, like, you know, doing battles and stuff. It's, it's terrific. Wow. Uh, winding this down here, you are, you know, this, this is in 2020 and, <laughs> Just like any other time, I guess, in the States, race is just as heavy a conversation as always. But you've had the privilege uh, to work with some of the most dopest, inspirational, you know, funkiest cats in black music ever. You're a white man. <laughs> How do, like, what do you attribute that to? Is just a pure love of this music you've put in your work they trust you but i mean i'm sure you understand the magnitude of the people you've been able to to work with man well i'm gonna say something that most people won't understand i'm i'm a white person but i'm jewish mm. now does mm. that or should that make a difference hell no of course, not. there were other white people who worked in black music. Some of them were Jewish, some were not. But I was got to differentiate because when you say you're a white man, a lot of people might get a picture of one of those guys with a <laughs> mag they had. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I feel what you're saying. That's hilarious. <laughs> My way of wow. separating myself from them <laughs> is to say I'm Jewish. Okay, That's hilarious. Because there are no Jews with MAGA hats in the back in the in the swamps of, 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 of Arkansas or wherever the fuck he goes with that shit. Oh my um, So I use that just as a separation point. <laughs> as a definition. Okay, that's the only relevance of the Judaism part. Um, but to answer your question, it it, it it really, I don't know, man. I've just been totally blessed. The, the only gig I ever chased really just said, okay, I'm going to go out and get that gig was James Brown. And, mm -hmm. and it was like, it was like I wanted to be a part of what he was doing. And I didn't know how I was going to fit in. It took a minute to figure out the skill set to be, actually make myself worthwhile. Because if you're going to be part of one of these camps, you got to you got to be you got to be necessary. Mm -hmm. Anybody going to pay you to be on the road unless you're necessary. So you got to figure out some way to be needed. And, um, you know, that's that's what took me to eventually to tour managing. It started as kind of writing publicity. That was what got me in the door. Um, and I had the access that radio gave me. I was working for a black radio station. 
in Virginia that promoted most of the shows that came through town. So that was an immediate backstage pass to any gig. So I got to made it my business to, I didn't want a career in radio. I wanted to get in music. So I was, you know, backstage and was able to mingle and meet all of these giants of the soul music era, because this was like the mid Mm sixties. So I'm backstage getting to meet Sam and Dave, Otis Redding, um, Solomon Burke, and obviously James Brown is Joe Tex and Jerry Butler. I mean, these were people I got to actually know every time they came through town, we'd hang out and they would teach me things and I'd ask advice and so on. Um, So that's, that's what kind of led to it. But from there, it was just, I just loved the music and it was like, okay, once I'm in there, it's kind of like once you're in there and you're accepted, it's kind of like, well, if he worked for James Brown for five years, I guess he must be okay. Right. So we'll play past the color thing at first. Mm. Um, it was kind of a, you know, it was a, it was a, it was, you know, I, I'm not going to front. Five years with James Brown and the membership card. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, that, that, that didn't mean you could run rampant. <laughs> you could not take that card for granted. <laughs> Don't put that card Because you can lose that card in a heartbeat. <laughs> you know, you got to one more thing wrong. Right. It's, it's programmed to evaporate in your hand. He's like on forever <laughs> probation. Yes, sir. <laughs> Always on probation. So, so uh, you know, I, I had enough sense to understand and respect the value of that right. card. Right. Um, but, but I honestly think that that's that's probably the answer to your question in a practical sense. Is once you're in there and and, and you know have have lived that because the, the James Brown was definitely the blackest gig I ever had. Mm-hmm. In terms of the experience of the job itself, mm-hmm. because I was working in a company where there was really only one or two other white people. Um, and we were working a circuit where many of the promoters and all the radio stations we worked with in every town were all black. So I was basically in the black music business with James Brown, even though he crossed over. Um his whole base was built around the black music industry. And it was a mom and pop industry back then. There was nothing corporatized or organized about it. So you dealt with all the venue managers in every town. You dealt with all the promoters in every town. Mm -hmm. You dealt with all the black radio stations in every town. So by the time I was with James Brown, after about a year, I pretty much had a Rolodex with everybody in the whole black music business. Um, Mm -hmm. And, um, it was training for everything because that, that definitely was the blackest environment I ever worked in because it was completely black. Say that. Say Whereas that. Whereas when you get with Prince, it's already integrated. You're dealing with white promoters. Mm. You're dealing with white managers. It's, it's mm. you know, and, and quite honestly, by then the world had changed. The culture had changed. We had evolved at least a little bit in terms of civil rights. And and every generation looks at race a little bit more, a little bit smarter, it seems. Mm. Um, it comes very cultural change because this is, this is, you oh. know, I, I used to, I used to be a real rabble rouser back in the sixties. I was like, you know, mad respect for Dr. Martin Luther King, but yeah. I'm with Stokely. Right? <laughs> oh, okay. Shit okay. Let's make this happen. So you, so right now what's popping, you are like, yes, this is. This is what I, not where we need. Yeah, well, we need to have this. I mean, it's it's supposed to. Be, we can't. We still got to stand up. It ain't over. Uh, oh, please! It ain't close to over. <laughs> yeah, it ain't, it ain't. And, and and unlike the past, <clears throat> it's enough now. Mm. It's enough now. People in the '60s had a patience. They knew there was going to be more. They knew they had a long way to go. And Martin Luther King was smart enough, even though in my youth. I was against his peaceful mm. mentality and his whole kind of kumbaya right. attitude toward violence. And I've never been a proponent of violence, but I understand the violence. Mm. I understand what creates that violence, where it comes from. And 
Martin Luther King understood it too. But what I now see in my, let's use the word loosely, wisdom um, of 73 years on this planet, mm. I understand what King understood, which is cultural change. When you're talking about a whole country, not just black America, not just rural white America with MAGA hats, not just liberal elites who are Biden supporters. I mean, America is made of so many different groups of people. When you expect cultural change from a group that large and that diverse, it's going to come very freaking slowly, no matter how much we push, no matter what we believe. And I think the most optimistic thing that's happened for me is God rest his soul at the expense of the tragedy here with, 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 with George mm -hmm. is that for the first time I can ever remember white people, not all, but a surprising amount of white people are actually asking themselves questions. Am I racist and I don't know it? What is this systemic racism that they're talking about? How does that manifest itself in me in ways I may not recognize? Hmm. I mean, this shit made me stop and think, okay? Right. Because when you talk about white privilege, it isn't necessarily something you go out intending to take advantage of it. You don't go out into the world and say, I'm white. I have a privilege. I'm going to use it. It isn't like a, 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 a credit card in your pocket to use. It's without question. You don't think about it because you don't understand that a black person, every time they step out of their house, are somehow reminded of their race. Are we on guard? <laughs> totally on guard. Now, sometimes the reminders can be pleasant. Sometimes it's a white person who's too nice to you in a store. Hmm. And you're like, okay, they're not that nice to the white customer, so why are they that nice to me? <laughs> Or then it's the cop who just wants to break your head. You know, I mean, it, it's like white people have never asked themselves the questions, what would it be like to walk in black shoes? And some people today are asking that question and actually trying to dig deep as to what this privilege, what so-called white privilege and systemic racism is about and what it's going to take to gradually erode that from our culture. Okay. And it's going to take time. And there's going to be collateral damage on both sides. I suspect that, God forbid, it'll get uglier than it is, particularly with this knucklehead losing the election. God only knows <laughs> what he's liable to rile up. Right, right. Um, so I'm, I'm not optimistic about the immediate future because there is going to be collateral damage. It's, it's, it's unavoidable. But I, I, I see the light at the end of the tunnel because if, if, if enough white people are willing to actually, actually for the first time, really try to understand in their gut, there's a lot of white people understand in their head. That's easy. You see the shit is wrong. <laughs> You see the black person isn't getting paid what the white person is. You right. see, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Anybody can see it in your head. But can you see it in your gut? And I see that there are people trying to get there. And it's really the first time in my lifetime I've ever seen that. Hmm. I was forced to see it because I have a black son. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, mm -hmm. so so that was you know I was mm -hmm. forced to understand that at, at 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 a young age. I mean, my son's forty five; he's no baby. <laughs> but, but you know, to no, this I day, it. I worry about it yeah. just because I know what cops can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm going to ask you this question, and, and we'll wrap up here. But uh, based off everything you just said, do you think it would? Prince would find it ironic of what's going on with his state in terms of like, you know, who controls it and there's no wheel. Um, you know, from the outside, you see news reports from, you know, his family says one thing, his bankers say the other thing. Uh, I would imagine it's not 
it's, it's run by a bank. So they ain't traditionally not black folks. <laughs> but would you think Prince, what do you think Prince would think of, uh, of his estate? And how things are. Does, do you think he would have thought there were people would release his music like this uh, on all the shit that's going on with it? He he always said. I remember we had a discussion once about a Jimi Hendrix reissue that came out, and, and this would have been in the nineties because I was still working at Paisley, early nineties, and one of those periodic Jimi Hendrix records came out that had old material that in some cases a producer had brought in musicians to finish tracks that Hendrix had started but hadn't finished. Mm. And we were talking about, Prince and I were talking about how unethical that was. And he was like, nobody's ever going to do that to my material. Mm. I ain't going to let that happen. And he predicted that the estate would be in a, would be an illegal struggle. That, that when he died, it was going to be bananas. That there would be fighting over this and fighting over that. And, you know, which was not difficult to predict because it was you know broken families and different mm -hmm. agendas and so on. So that was what happened was kind of easy to predict. Um, but it's. As far as, as these deluxe editions and stuff, I honestly think he would, I don't see what he could find wrong with them. Um, I mean, the, the, the 1999 package I thought was very well done. Mm -hmm. And the Sign of the Times package I think is stellar. It's fabulous. Um, and I think it puts the unfinished tracks or the, the outtakes in, in the proper perspective. Um there's nothing about it that second guesses him and everything was done to try to master the music as close as possible to what he would have done. Nobody's trying to reinvent shit. Mm. And um, I think they're showing the utmost respect creatively to it. I think the great, I think stuff's great. I really do. And um, whether he would, whoever knows, it, it, you know, it's like what I said and thought when I was 30 years old is not the same thing I say now in many cases. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think that he's the same way. I mean, people grow, people change. And all of his cussing and fighting about his vault and nobody's ever going to do this and nobody's going to touch my songs and stuff. That was the young prince. I don't know what the what the older prince would say. What do you think he would say just about the handling of his affairs and where it should be and all that type of stuff? Well, like I said, he predicted it would be a legal hassle okay. because he knew his family and he knew their agendas and who got along and who didn't get along and who was greedy and who was not. <laughs> so, I you. you know, I think this is all kind of predictable. I'm, I'm sure he, did, he would dislike it. Mm. He never liked his business in the street. And, um, you know, it's, it's tacky and I'm sure he would see it that way. Uh, big sexy. Did you have anything to ask to before we wrap up here? Yeah, real quick. <clears throat> uh, Alan with the sign of the times box, which, you know, we, Michael and myself, we both have on mm -hmm. vinyl and it is amazing. Um, have you considered or even thought about participating in the parade one, if that's the next one, because a lot of the people who've written essays, don't get me wrong. They're very, you know, heartfelt and all that, but your voice is missing in my opinion. And I would love it if you would, or if you already thought about it and don't want to do it. Great. But I would like it if you would, you know, put something in the next set in the form of an essay or an article or just your thoughts on it. Have they, has anyone reached out to you about that? All they have to do is ask me. Um, there was a preliminary discussion about doing something for this Sign of the Times package, but they never followed up on it. And I don't know the reason. I mean, I, I think what's in there is great. I love the Susan Rogers stuff. And I think what's been written in these booklets for these two projects is absolutely terrific. 
Um, so you know, I've got no horse in that race. But in terms of any any future projects, I'm available. All you got to do is reach out. Right. All right. Uh, right but don't on. tell me. Tell them. <laughs> oh, don't think I won't. <laughs> uh, this is for the the kid who finds this podcast you know, six or seven years from now, and they're just getting into Prince. Uh, what could you tell them? What is what, what should they know about Prince, Alan? Hmm. That he was at the forefront of basically a cultural moment in our time and took the music a step forward. He moved, he moved the music. There's there's art forms have evolutions. And you know, you can go way back to WC Handy and Louis Armstrong and so on and so on and create this evolution. There's hundreds of maybe thousands of great artists in the realms of black music, from jazz to pop to funk to soul to doo-wop to any any genre you wanna that gospel, spirituals. But there's only a handful of artists who actually took that 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 creative arc and moved that evolution forward. You know, James was one, Sly, George, then Prince. Mm. And anybody who moved that moved that forward, you gotta check them out. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, Mr. Hold, Lee. Hold on, oh, I'm sorry. Hold Go on. ahead. Um, <laughs> we got pretty heavy in the last uh, half hour or so. So I'm going to lighten the mood a bit. So, <clears throat> Alan, looking at your resume, as we all know, you know, you were James, Harold Merrill, the Blue Notes, Cameo, Prince, D'Angelo, and so on and so forth. But, uh, the square peg in that picture is Kiss. Now, I'm a big-time <laughs> Kiss fan, and when I heard that, I'm like, and I look at the year, so were you on the, and I correct me if I'm wrong here, but were you on the either Creatures of the Night tour or Lick It Up tour and then went straight Creatures. from that to Prince? You were Creatures, Creatures. and went straight to Prince? Creatures. Creatures wow. straight to Prince. There were, wow. there were there were like two dates left on the Creatures tour, and I I asked the genius if he would let me go two days early because I had an opportunity to jump on the Prince tour. Both tours were on the West Coast, um, just basically following each other. We played, let's see, we played, um, um, what the hell was it? Was um, that venue they tore down in California? Um, Jesus Christ. Uh, senior moment. Anyway, we played L.A. with Kiss, <laughs> and then Prince was coming in two days later. And um, it was a good opportunity for me to jump on the Prince thing if I was going to do it. And Simmons said, yeah, go check, go get it, you know, do it. It's, it's you know, this thing's over. It will let you go early. But, um, yeah, K K Kiss was definitely the anomaly. But, um, you know, it was the same old thing. I needed a gig, and somehow that fell in my lap. And, um, you know, it was a good experience. I mean, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley were great. They were hysterical. They were, it, was, it, was, um, it, was, it was a good experience. All right. All right. <laughs> I, I mean, part of it was I didn't have to listen to the shows. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a fun guy, so I get that. I get that. <laughs> it, 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 it actually worked out that way. I, you know, I was impressed. I'm look at all the technology and shit and the gimmicks and the, you know, the flying and spitting blood. And the, but it was kind of like, you know, you've seen it once, that's enough. Um, it was kind of going to be the same every night. Um but actually, they they required certain things in the hotel when they got back. They were one of the acts that did runners. They didn't go back to their dressing rooms after the show. So they're in full outfits, all at crazy regalia, which was heavy. I don't know how they moved on stage. I mean, the, the outfit Gene Simmons wore must have weighed a ton. 
I mean, it was really heavy suit of armor looking stuff. <laughs> and um, but they would come back to the hotel like that, sweat dripping down, a towel around their neck, um, totally filled with sweat and and dripping all this fake blood and all the rest of that. That's how they'd walk into the lobby of the hotel. And <laughs> each of the four guys had a recipe for what they wanted in their room when they got back. And it was like, you know, food, food. Like the, the, the one guy wanted a fruit salad. The other guy wanted chicken. Next guy wanted, you know, soup, whatever. They each had their own thing for what they wanted. And Gene Simmons was the most particular. He wanted a certain kind of fruit salad, but he wanted certain kind of fruits. And this tour was playing a lot of B markets, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, places where he, I'd never been because black shows didn't go there. <laughs> you know, this was this was they didn't back then. You didn't call it that, but it's what we now call Trump country. Um, hmm. So th these we were playing towns like that, and in those towns you don't have Ritz Carlton's, you don't have Four Seasons Hotel. You got a Holiday Inn, might be the best, or, or if you're lucky, there's a Hyatt. You know, so these kitchens in these restaurants in these hotels, they didn't, they weren't first class kitchens. So it got to the point where, in order to get him what they what they really wanted in their rooms, because they wanted to like get off the elevator. Put the key in the door, walk in the room, and everything is set up on it on a table already there. It wasn't like they're going to get to the room and then order it, and it comes 10 minutes later. No, it should be in the room. So my thing was like, okay, guys, here's the deal. I'm going to take you to the gig, ride with you. You got security and all, but I'm going to be in the hotel lobby when you get back, waiting for you, supervising the restaurant crews to make sure that the shit that goes in your room is correct. Well, it got to the point where I was not only doing that, I was taking the limo. As soon as the show started, I would grab one of the limos and actually go to a fresh food market, find a market and would buy different fruit and vegetables wow. and go back to hotel and make the salad myself because he hated <laughs> the salads in these cheesy hotels. <laughs> so that, that was, you know, it was a salad maker. <laughs> yeah, it was a very different, different gig. Uh, I never made salad anywhere else. But, <laughs> but for Gene Simmons, what the fuck, you know. <laughs> and I, and it got me. Listen, instead of having to stand there for two and a half hours and listen to that shit, I <laughs> <laughs> actually go out, do some shopping, and you know, I'm picking up food for him and I'm getting a little something for myself and, wow. and I'm I'm back at the hotel making salads with the TV on by nine o'clock. I'm good, you know. Very that's a pretty good gig. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's 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 how I chose to look at it. And they were pleasant guys and you know, it it, it turned out Gene Simmons grew up about two blocks from where I used to spend my summers in Jackson Heights in, in Queens, New York. And um, hmm. we talked about the fact that we would have gone to the same school. We both were familiar with the same candy store that sold baseball cards and comic books when we were kids, you know, where you got, where you got, you know, ice cream and so on. And, and uh, so we bonded behind that. All right. Right on. Right on. Well, man, we could sit here for hours <laughs> easily. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed this. I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I want to respect your time. So, uh, it's, man, it's Alan. My wife says, if there's somebody who listen, you will keep talking. I guess she's right. <laughs> um, well, I've enjoyed I, this. I got a break. No, oh, no, we're going to cut. We're cut. But I just want to thank you so much for coming out here. Really appreciate you. Uh, and man, you are a treasure to the game, man. So I definitely no, man, I, you. I've, I've enjoyed talking to you guys. It's a tribute because trust me, I wouldn't have stayed on that long if y'all weren't dope. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, you know, like I always say, work it like a job. We'll see you next time. Peace. Peace. All right. There we go.